Thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, so, so welcome to the, the first Caithness Committee meeting of 2023, and we'll see what this year brings us. Um, the meeting is recorded and we'll go out on the website at some stage. The agenda has been circulated and there was also a supplementary report to item 11 sent out and in terms of standing order 8 and as chair of Caithness Committee, I have to agree to take an urgent item of business on garage rents 2023-24 in order to agree a level of rent increase to apply to Caithness garages and garage sites for the financial year 23-24. And this will be item 12 on the agenda. Have we received any apologies? At all. Chairman, we've received one apology from Councillor Mackey. OK, I think everyone else is here. That's, that's fine. Thanks for that. Um, we'll move on to any declarations of interest on any of the items. I'm not seeing anything coming up. No, nope, we'll take that as uh, no. The, on to the, the minutes of the uh, previous meeting have been circulated for noting and were approved by Council. Uh, any comments any members wish to make? Not seeing any, any hands. Yep. So we're happy to accept that. Um, and I move on to the police report. Area performance summary, and I believe um, Richard Ross they will, will be going through the paper. So I can hand over to Richard. Good morning, Chair. Um, my intention would be to run through the report and then open up to questions if you're, you're happy with that. Um, as I said, just without Richard Ross, I'm covering for the area commander at the moment who's uh, away. Oh, yeah, I'm just at the start of the meeting. Okay. Hi, Jan. If you could just switch your mic off, Jan. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Sorry, Richard. Uh, sorry. No, no problem. Hey, uh, so I'll just run through the, the document page by page. So, obviously, this uh, report is the, the screening report for the period 1st of April um, 22 to 31st of December 22. Basically, uh, picking out some of the commander's comments. Obviously, uh, we're not long out of the sort of lockdown COVID challenges, and we now move into the, the cost of living challenges, which are I mean, impacting on communities. Uh, and our team work regularly with our partners to try and uh, deal with some of the issues that that is uh, creating for vulnerable people within the community. Then moving on, uh, we've throughout the period under uh, report, we've maintained our presence on Highland Roads, enforcing traffic legislation, Improving road safety and investigating collisions. I know that the uh, road safety is a particular area of concern to to councils, um, particularly around the increase in visitors that that happens each year. So throughout the period, we've continued to work alongside uh, the visit, visitor management team and the visitor management plan uh, to try and prevent any issues, and we'll continue with that work in the year going forward. As we go through the report, you'll see the work that has been done in terms of uh, road safety and uh, road detection. In terms of violence, it's pleasing to see a reduction in the number of common assaults and assaults on emergency service workers in the period uh, under review, although there has been a, a slight increase in serious assaults. Um, it's also pleasing to see that in the Caithness area, there's been a reduction in house break-ins. Rod has continued to increase, and that's uh, fairly uh, much a national picture, and I'll cover more of in terms of frauds shortly. Um, then he, he's made comment regarding the increase in missing person inquiries from last year. That's probably uh, partly down to um, you know, restrictions on movement, etc. Have uh, have eased, people are back to normal life, etc. What you will see is there has been a, a significant increase in terms of looked after children. Um, what we'll see is the figures are quoted are not specific to Caithness, they are for N division, they're not broken down to Caithness level. So 
obviously when you see the figures that uh, may may have seemed very high, but that's because it's divisional level. In terms of hate crime across the area, they they, they remain low. There has been an increase in instance of hate crime recorded in the Caithness area, and I'll speak about that in more detail shortly. Um, covering our local policing priorities, so at the moment they, they remain as road safety and road crime, antisocial behaviour, violence and disorder, acquisitive crime, protecting vulnerable people, serious and organised crime, terrorism and public order. Uh, the next page is Caithness at a glance, which will give a sort of overview of the priorities. So in terms of road safety and road crime, overall road crime offences have increased against the five year and the last year to date. Mobile phone offences have increased uh, against the five year, but slightly down on last year to date. And failure to ensure against third party risks have increased against both the five year and the last year to date. And that's an indication of the proactive policing that is carried out in relation to uh, road safety and road crime. Moving on to antisocial behaviour, disorder and violence. Uh, so overall, antisocial behaviour has increased uh, against both the, the five year and the last year to date. As I said, the common assaults have decreased by both five year and last year today, um, although serious and assaults have increased compared to the previous year. For acquisitive crime, overall there has been a, an increase in acquisitive crime, um, although house break-ins have for to dwelling houses has decreased uh, against the five year and the last year to date. Figures broad uh, as I said, has increased, and that is a national picture we're seeing um, in terms of uh, frauds, particularly online type fraud activity. For protecting vulnerable people, overall sexual crime has increased against the five year and the last year to date. Figures, um, domestic crimes have increased compared to the five year, but there was a decrease compared to the last year to date, a decrease of eight fewer domestic related crimes. And as I've said already, um, hate crime has increased by both the, the five year and the last year to date. In terms of serious and organised crime, um, there has been a, a reduction in compared to the five year and to the last year to date, uh, although there is only one fewer um, drug supply offence in that time. There is a section on uh, the priority for counter-terrorism and domestic extremism. I'm not going to read that, it's there, it's there to be read. There's no statistics in that. Um, and as previously reported, we don't report statistics in relation to that. Moving on to the, the more detailed uh, work. So in terms of road safety and road crime, there's been three fatalities in the period under review, that is an increase on one compared to the previous year. Drink and drug driving offences have decreased by seven, but uh, the figure for the year is 34, so it's still disappointing to see uh, people are willing to take that risk. Uh, although, obviously, there's the proactive policing has detected a significant number. And in terms of speeding, the figures have gone up uh, by an extra 20 to 78 for the year. For road safety and road crime, our focus is based around Operation Cedar, which is to challenge, educate, detect and reduce. And that's a strategy that we have for um, our road safety work, and that will continue throughout the year. That's led by our, our road policing colleagues, but supported by local policing officers. And as you'll see from the the numbers detected, there's a lot of proactive work going on in that area. Moving on to antisocial behaviour, disorder and violence. He has said a decrease in assaults, though there has been an increase in serious assaults and a, a decrease in the number of drug possession offences. Moving on to the preventative work we do, there's a section in the report regarding the harm prevention officer, which is an 18 month pilot. Um, it's a funded post funded by the um, Drugs and Alcohol 
um, partnership. That's due for review shortly. Let's hope that that will continue. That role is having benefit across the division in identifying people who are vulnerable to uh, substance uh, misuse issues and trying to provide uh, the correct support to them from partner agencies. Work in terms of No Knives, Spare Lives continues with an educational program uh, in schools across the division. Moving on to acquisitive crime, uh, as Freddie said, housebreaking to trans has decreased, uh, fraud has increased, and as I've said already, that's a national issue or a national trend, particularly around uh, online offending. Um, we do a lot of uh, media work in terms of that, trying to put messaging out there. Unfortunately, the, the specific tactics change regularly from the from the criminals, they change their tactic um, and how they do, they can all quite often be very sophisticated um, how they go about their business. But we do try to put out as much media and messaging as we can. We also have the, the banking protocol, which is uh, work we do with financial institutes to try and identify people who may be uh, subject to ongoing um, financial crime there then and to take action to prevent it happening. So that that works very well, but a number of uh, notable successes across the division in terms of the banking protocol. And each year we work with our uh, partners and the financial institutes to refresh awareness of that to ensure that continues. In the report, there's also a section on Rural Watch. Uh, I'd encourage you to read that and sign up for the Rural Watch alerts. Um, to get messaging around uh, in terms of ongoing threats in the area. Uh, moving on to protecting vulnerable people, as said, uh, sexual crime has increased. Um, domestic crimes have dec decreased by eight over the, the period compared to last year, uh, um, with an increase in hate crime. In terms of missing people, uh, there's an increase of 50, as I've said already, that um, one of may be anticipated as people have gone about their lives they, um, following lockdown, that there would be more incidents where people are out and about more. Um, and there has been an increase in looked after children. But as a division, we are working with the care providers and also uh, the residents to try and reduce the number of incidents that take place. Um, in terms of serious and organised crime, as I've said already, there's a slight reduction of one uh, in the number of drug supply offences compared to the year today. There's then a section in terms of county lines, which obviously is uh, criminality that um, the whole division is um, susceptible to. Our work is ongoing in terms of county lines, and uh, we've recently increase the number of staff within the unit that's dedicated to targeting county line activity. And although based in Inverness, they work divisionally and provide support into the Caithness area as well. Um, so that, that work is ongoing in relation to that. And again, the, the further detail in terms of counter-terrorism, um, it's, it's there to read. I won't go into too much detail, although there is an offer. And within that, in terms of uh, educational um, inputs that can be provided if required or if, if desired by councillors. The report then finishes with the uh, crime statistics, which I, I won't go through individually. They're there to read, but I'm happy to take questions in relation to anything that's within the report, Chair. OK, thank you very much. Um, a lot of good, good stuff there, Richard. Yeah, yeah. Generally, crime seems to be going down more than going up, so, so that's good. That's good. And I see Stephen's there as well to take any case in this thing. So I can open it up now to members if anybody um, would, would like any questions or any points they want to raise with Richard or Stephen. You can raise your hands. Janet, on you go. Thanks. Thanks, Richard, for the report. The report I read for the police report was actually dated the 1st of April 21 to the 31st of December 21. It come through to us. 
I'm not sure that's happened. The report I've got and the report of the Samaritan is uh, the front page is 1st of April 22 to 31st December 22. Well, mine, the one that came through to me was the 1st of April 21 to the 31st of December 21. But for by for by, you've, you've, gave, you've gave the report. So overall, you think the crime's down? Well, it depends on the on the category of yeah. uh, the category of crime and the scene. It's detailed. Yes, some some uh, crimes have increased, some have decreased, um, but the specifics of each of them is uh, is detailed in the report. Yeah. Um, and in terms of you haven't got the wrong report, I'll I'll chase that up and see if we can get the correct one sent out. Thank you very much, Richard, for that. Um, road safety. Um, going back to road safety, how's the road safety in Caithness with the, the states of the roads? Is there more accidents or more incidents. I wonder if you could answer that. Um, I'm not aware of any specific issues in terms of uh, road condition uh, leading to either accidents or uh, offences, but maybe uh, Stephen? Stephen could come in further for the local context. No, it's certainly not something we're noticing um, an increase in RTCs related specifically to potholes um, or states of the roads. Um, it's just your standard numbers for the careless driving from having lack of attention on the road that we're seeing. Nothing particularly obvious in that in that respect. Thanks, Stephen. Other question I was going to ask, how's the staffing levels? Okay, nice. Stephen. Yep, so staffing is it's always a challenge. Uh, we're finding that a challenge um, division wide and I dare say Scotland wide too. Um, sort of real term budget cuts so obviously having an impact on that. Um, we do we, we do have a number of vacancies up in Caithness, um, but we're trying hard to to fill them. We've we've been running low on supervisors recently, but we've now managed to have um, two local officers. They've managed to um, get themselves through the promotion board, and they're now taking up these supervisor posts. So we've now got a full complement of uh, supervisors, um, and. It's now just trying to fill the vacancies on the shifts um, when the next round of probation has come in or people applying to come to Caithness to take up these posts. How many but, vacancies have we got? Um, at the moment, we've got five vacancies. Thank you. OK, John, thanks. Um, Thank sorry, you. Matthew, I, I realise that your hand was up first. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I've now found the hands here. So, so, so Matthew, have you got some? Points. Oh, that's fine, Chair. Um, morning, Richard. Nice to see you again after many years on yourself, Steve. Um, yeah, that last statistic that Jan, Councillor McEwen just mentioned, um, I speak with absolute authority on this. Five, <clears throat> when the officers are so busy, five is a very heavy burden to bear for the force. And I add my weight to just <laughs> anything you can do to get those numbers. I'm sure all of us will support you in getting those numbers back up. Um, thanks for the report, first of all. Um, I was wondering about the dates as well, partly, um, Steve, because it has your predecessor's name, Inspector Goskirk, on the front of it. So, um, yeah, query there. But my main uh, thing I'd like to ask about, and I realise you've just mentioned budgets being cut and all the rest of it, is, but in Thurso, as you're probably aware, um, we're now just down to one member of support staff manning the front counter. So that means that basically the police station for most of the time is closed. It's on the A9, it's on the North Coast 500, it's in the centre of a, a busy town. Um, I had to use the public phone two or three months ago and I think after about 90 seconds I was cut off and the lady I was speaking to in Glasgow, she sort of said you need to speak really quickly because you've only got 90 seconds. It's a really poor substitute for a friendly face at, at a, in a front counter. Um, it's just really to highlight that and I, I would like to know, <clears throat> excuse me, if other police stations of a similar size are also down to just one member of staff on the front counter. So that's my specific question, but allied to that, and again, it's nothing that you gentlemen can do very much about, um, but it's just constant refrain from people is that they can't get through on 101. Now, to be fair, I actually had to ring 101 a few weeks ago and I got through almost immediately <laughs> just to balance it up. But on other occasions, I've waited a very, very long time to get through. Um, my final point really is um, at third, well, two, two points at recent meeting of Thursday Community Council. Um, first of all, Sergeant Todd, who was present, 
was absolutely excellent. Um, publicly compliment him on the way he answered the questions in a straightforward, plain English manner and gave members of the community council the information they were asking for. It was absolutely excellent to have him there. But the second point is again, it's really just this is uh, to support you. Um, the number of con what I would loosely call concern for person calls was just a sky high figure. It was running at something like two a day on average. And I know, as, as you do, that a call like that might just be 10 minutes, but it could be several hours of work. And the drain on the manpower for those calls is considerable. And anecdotally, and I stand to be corrected, but anecdotally, I have a very strong suspicion that a goodly number of those calls ideally should be being dealt with by the NHS and not by Police Scotland. And it's taking Police Scotland officers away from the core duties that the public would love them to be doing such as being out on the streets, catching drug dealers, doing radar speed checks and these kind of things. But instead they are, it, it does appear to be increasing, you know, being expected to do tasks that arguably are not really their job and which they're not ideally trained for um, the NHSR. So um, sorry, Chair, I've gone on a little bit, but those are my main points. Um, the staffing of the control room in Thursday, the staffing of the front counter in the police station and the drain on um, availability of the police due to these concern for person calls. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll try and answer the, the points uh, points raised. Uh, hopefully, I've noted them all down. So, in first of all, in terms of vacancies, uh, obviously we are uh, regularly advertising for uh, constable posts, uh, both within our division and nationally, to try and attract people to Caithness. So that's work ongoing. We also review uh, the staffing levels um, and staffing projections on a monthly basis to try and uh, keep ahead of that. So that is work ongoing to attract people into the area uh, to fill these vacancies. In terms of staffing levels for the front counter staff in Thurso, that is consistent uh, with other stations of size within the, the area, which I think was the question, was it consistent across the area? So yes, it is consistent. Some may have slightly more, but also comes down to whether people are full-time, part-time, etc. But the staffing level is consistent. In terms of one on one, if there's any specific issues that you become aware of with uh, getting through, um, please uh, raise them with us. We can look at uh, that uh, circumstance at that particular time. Uh, and also, we'd encourage that there's the contact us section on the internet uh, where you can contact us by email as well. Um, if it's not urgent to speak to somebody. So that can be a good way of reporting stuff without having to wait in a, a phone queue. In terms of the issue of being told you only had 90 seconds, um, I'm not aware of that uh, at all. Being a policy I would have expected a call takes as long as a call takes. Uh, but again, I'll speak to C3 about that. I think that may, may be a, an issue to be brought up with the staff rather than uh, any form of policy. Uh, in terms of your comments about Sergeant Dodd, that's pleasing to hear how, how well he presented the facts and uh, that'll be fed back to him. The next point was in relation to concern for person calls. Yes, we have a lot of concern for person calls. And as you've rightly said from your own knowledge, that could last five minutes, that could last a shift to deal with. But um, every call we get is risk assessed. Uh, and given the appropriate priority for a lot of concern for person calls uh, is down to ensuring somebody's uh, safety or, or well-being. So the, the priority level for that. Whether other agencies should be involved, yes, on occasions they should be. Um, but for us, it's about preservation of life or for their health and well-being. So we have to put an appropriate resource to that. I think I've covered your points. Matthew, unless there's anything else you You've okay. done very well, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I think now that um, Wally, Wally Mackay, you've got your hand up. Uh, yeah. I'll go to Carl after that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, well done, gentlemen, uh, for your report, Richard and Stephen. I'm very interested and always have been in your reports and always trying to look for some questions for you. I see a lot of driver behaviour, which I do not like. I've been a high mileage driver around the county of Keith Ness. Now, I'm very interested in how you weigh up your priorities because you are struggling. There's no doubt about it, you are struggling with staff numbers. We'll hear that time and time again. Uh, 
But irrespective of you struggling, st struggling with, with stuff numbers, you say you, you've increased your proactivity uh, in detecting uh, car mobile use, speeding and drink driving. Now, I just question that because that's there the whole time. And I've never seen an improvement in that behaviour by drivers, never. There's no improvement whatsoever. They're at it the whole time. And is it a bit of luck that you're on the road that you detect that? And how can you increase your activity when your staff numbers are very, very low? So good luck to you if you can do it. You're doing a tremendous job, there's no doubt about it. But this driver behaviour is, is really serious and it's not going to go away. The risk takers are there day after day. So good luck to you all because you've done a fantastic job. But I would like to see an increase in your in your numbers. And if you can get that, well and good. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor. So uh, to go through your points there, so first of all, in terms of staffing, uh, in terms of road policing, it's not just your local officers who are involved in the road policing. We obviously have our colleagues from uh, the road policing unit who are regularly in Caithness, um, and obviously they're 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 dedicated to road traffic um, crime. What I would also say is yes, the officers are busy in Caithness, but I would say it's actually a credit to them that whilst being equally as busy, they're still detecting offences in terms of road. Uh, road crime at the same time they're out there um, you say whether it's by luck it knows by being out there uh, and detecting the offences um, so the, the officers are out they are trying whilst having busy workloads as well uh, for other other types of calls to us so we are trying to maintain the proactivity and to do that we're using local officers plus actually our national resources as well OK, thank you. Um, Carl, are you wanting to come in now? Uh, thanks, Ron. Good morning, Richard and Stephen. Um, I'm just going to take a wee bit of time to, to highlight the value, because I, I, pre I appreciate you made a comment about the pressures on funding. Um, so I work directly with a couple of your officers in my capacity as a chair of the Caithness Drug and Alcohol Forum. So I just want to highlight the value and uh, acknowledge the contribution that both uh, both of your uh, officers make. And uh, it's, we've seen a, a, a very pleasing um, increase, uh, I think, in, the, in effectiveness of what we do. And uh, recently, and, and trust me, both both officers are centre in front of that. So, you know, I understand the pressures when you're considering how you allocate your funding, but uh, it would be fantastic if if they could continue. You know, some of there's we're now seeing some really effective uh, projects. If they're not already underway, they're being proposed, and it's in support in in conjunction with uh, other stakeholders and different services. So yeah, you know, I'm sure you'll understand if if we're successful with these things, it, it leads to prevention and education, and um, Hopefully, uh, eliminating a lot of uh, issues that we've we've experienced over the years. So, uh, a bit of unashamed lobbying on <laughs> to, to continue your support if you can. So, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thanks, Councillor Watts. Is uh, you're right in terms of uh, the work of the the drug forums. Um, that is its joint work, which we will continue to support. Um, you no know, one agency. Can do it alone, so we'll continue with that partnership, working to to try and deal with the the substance misuse issues in the area. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Jan. If you still got your, is that another question you want, or is it historical hand? Yeah, no, I I, I just want to ask another question, and I would actually just say to uh, Richard and Stephen, your your officers are really a really a credit to you, um, with the way they work. I mean, they are they're absolutely a credit to you. I actually worked in the justice service for over 30 years and crime really hasn't went down. The only thing it's went down is the police resources. Um, I'm sorry to say, I mean, you do a fantastic job with what you've got. Um, but in the 30 years I was in the justice service, it's the police resources on the ground that's went down. I would like to actually see a review of the staffing level in Caithness and also a review of the the police stations being reopened 24 7. Crime doesn't always work between nine and five. You normally find crime works between five and maybe five the next morning. Um, 
people need to go somewhere for safety and to go and get a police station closed is, is not good public public services. I actually went to the police station three times last month through the day and in quick and it was closed. So I, I would like to you know, put forward for a view of the resources and the stations being reopened 24-7. Orkney Police Station is open far longer than ours is. And uh, the crime rate's a lot a lot lower over there than it is in Caithness. That's that's just my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, Richard, do you want to reply to that? Yes, yeah, so in terms of staffing levels, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not able to increase the staffing levels. I mean, so, you know, um, we'd, we'd happily have more staff, as I'm sure everybody would. Um, but I will feed that in uh, to our, our management team. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. I, I'd really appreciate that. And anything we can do to help with that, I'm sure as councillors, we all will do for the public at Caithness. Thanks. Okay, thanks for that, Jan. Uh, Stephen, do you want to come in just before Matthew there? Yeah, please. Going back to asking for a review, you should probably know there's a, a national review taking place um, across Police Scotland. Um, and it'll be going on for the next uh, the next few months, going around different command areas to kind of review the needs or well, how the needs of the police and the local communities and, and how we can align them better. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing how that review goes. But um, I don't know how long the whole review will take, but it's 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 like six, several months anyway. Will we be able to input into that, Stephen? Um, I don't know how the, the the mechanics of it will work at the, um, at the moment. I think that I think. I, what my assessment is they're doing they'll be doing internal reviews first. No, and there is actual consultations with some public um, um but I can get more information for you on that. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, Stephen, that's fine. You can maybe keep us updated with that as as the year goes on. Um Matthew, do you want to come in? Um yeah, thank you, Chair. I wasn't expecting to speak again, but in relation to what Councillor McEwen was just saying, I couldn't support what she's saying more. Um Stevie, you said you're looking forward to review. I'm, I hope I'm looking forward to the review, but uh, obviously reviews can work both ways. It might be good news for KFNS or it might be bad news. Um, I just really want to remind members and anybody else who's listening to this that you don't need to go back that number of years. Take Thurzo and Wick was the same. Both police stations were open to the public 24 seven. And in fact, if you did have to shut the police station as a sergeant, I can remember you had to explain yourself to the inspector. The station was open. There were sometimes destitute people sleeping in the police station, so they weren't out on a cold street. That was the level of service that was provided. And as far as the sergeants were concerned, who are arguably the most important rank in the service, uh, there were four in Thurzo and four in Wick. They each had their shift to look after, or she had their shift to look after. Now, if fully staffed, there's five sergeants instead of eight to do the uniform work. And yes, one or two parts of the work have been specialised. But overall, overall, the numbers of uniformed officers available to the public seem to have unfortunately been dropped. And yes, there is an argument that there is uh, arguably more activity in other areas of police work. Um, but for the general public, it is the uniformed officers who are really the jack of all trades and master of all trades. They're the ones the public see and really would love to see a higher presence. So uh, effectively, I just add my full support to what Jan's just been saying. And I know you <clears throat> gentlemen don't have much. You can, it's difficult for you to do this, but if you can just pass on um, our comments, that would be much appreciated and good luck with all the work you are doing. Thank, thank you, Matthew. Um, I can add a wee bit. I, I used to be in Northern Constabulary and I, I do remember that figures and uh, maybe the public didn't realise how well we were off then, <laughs> but never mind. Um, I just wanted to echo something else Matthew said about the, the sergeant coming along to the First Community Council. It, it was really, really good. Uh, the other points, uh, quite recently I've been to two other Community Council meetings and unfortunately, there's no officers that can manage to come along. And it, it's something that's been raised through the Association of Community Councils. Uh, and it would be nice if we could get an officer along to, to the various community councils. I, I know some of them send reports, but to get a, a physical presence would be good. But I know the pressures that you're under. Uh, I, I just also want, want to say that I, I, I did get to see uh, 
a freedom of information request that Matthew referred to for January to December 2022 and the number of concern for welfare incidents the Police Scotland attended in Caithness was a staggering 695. Uh, and that's that's almost two a day. Uh, and and as, as has been said, that it, the, the time that takes up for the officers, uh, you know, it's really, really challenging for yourselves. But thankfully, you're there to do it, you know. So, so, so again, I just want to give my thanks for that. Um, like, uh, uh, Wally, Wally, do you want to come in there? Yes, Chair, just on that comment about the police attending community council meetings. Ten years ago, the police was the number one agenda on the community council meetings and the rooms were packed. People loved to come along and listen to the police. It was really, really good to see them. Lots of people, which is not the case nowadays, as our members are low at turning out to community councils. But I know the police are up against it, but they were really, really popular and they were always first on and then they could leave the meeting afterwards. But I know the resources don't allow that now. But in the past, they were really, really popular and they still would be if they could come along. So all the best. Thank you, Wally. Stephen, you want to a hand up? Yeah, so community council attendance, it's something on that, that I am trying to address. Um, yeah, significant challenges. It's the evening times are peak times. Um, so trying to release an officer to be there um, is very difficult. And even if we do commit to go in there, generally we're finding that we're having to cancel at very last minute and often without any notice to the community council. So it's coming across very unprofessional. I am trying to find a compromise to find to, to kind of meet the needs um, of the community councils. The Thursday community council I just want to say is the, the two the last two officers that have had that in their portfolio, Sergeant Todd and Sergeant Miller. Um, these were officers that were willing to, like, they, they, they took on that own their responsibility and they were doing the attendance in their own time, um, coming off duty to actually attend these meetings. Um, so um, so WIC, WIC hasn't been getting that same same kind of response. I have had meetings with the WIC Community Council recently. Um, unfortunately, Mondays is a, an evening that's not suitable for me to attend because of my own personal commitments. Um, but we are trying to work through a compromise where they can get a, maybe a three monthly meeting with myself um, on a different night to, to kind of meet, just to kind of have a, have a compromise. Um, but I am trying to lift the liaison between all the rural community councils as well with the officers. Um, but we will sh we will find that compromise. I just don't know what that compromise is going to look like yet. I was hoping to raise it uh, last week at the chair of council meetings, but that was cancelled. So when it gets rescheduled, we'll look to have that discussion. OK, thank you, Stephen. Yes, I, I know I know you're very keen because we, we had a meeting not that long ago with uh, Castleton Community Council over a matter and you personally came along, so I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, Raymond, you want to come in? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind. Um, in terms of the uh, police attendance of every uh, community council, 13 community councils in Caithness on a monthly basis, you multiply that by 12, you get the amount of meetings that, uh, that the police would have to attend and therefore you would have to ask yourself, is that the best use of police resources? Especially if you're expecting them to turn up on their own time off shift to be able to make that representation. You're right, it has been made uh, mention to the Association of Caithness Community, Community Councils, and uh, Inspector Gosker did say at the last time that he valued the ability to be able to attend the, uh, the Association of Caithness Community Councils, and, and frequently did, without exception, with, uh, with the exception, I think the only one was COP26 in Glasgow, where all police resources were, um, uh, imp uh, you know, impacted, impacted on. For me, um, if there was an effective relationship, a continued effective re relationship, because I think it is an, an effective relationship, um, as uh, the inspector said there just now, between the Association of Caithness Community Councils and the uh, and the inspector, then surely all community councils have at least got that um, ability to be able to make their representation and have that discussion. Once, uh, once, once a quarter, um, and any and, and any issues that uh, that prevail within the three months can actually be uh, discussed, raised, forwarded on through the Association of Caithness Community Councils. I believe that's a really, really good vehicle, and one that I think would uh, provide a really good compromise, so that uh, community councils don't feel that they are being overlooked when they don't get representation from the police uh, service and other uh, uh, community councils do. I don't think that that's fair and I don't I don't think it's either fair on the community councils and I don't think it's fair on the police um, either. So I think that we should um, 
flesh that out at the Association of Caithness Community Councils. Uh, and I believe that the, the new chair has that uh, on his mind. And the only reason that it was cancelled was because of illness. So I'm, I'm absolutely certain that he's looking to, to reschedule that. The other one, in terms of um, the closure of um, the, the the closure of uh, police stations and the reduction in uh, in, in police so um, in police personnel, as opposed to the difficulty or challenges in being able to recruit, I think that's a that isn't just in caseness. Um, that's in other areas as well. That happened. The police stations uh, closed in other areas of the Highlands, and police resources also. Um, uh, impinged upon and impacted on in similar ways in in other areas of the Highlands. So I think maybe we could uh, that that um, picture could be endorsed if you like, and um, it could be further uh, supported um, by um, augmenting the Highland picture as well as um, as well as Caithness um, in terms of the concerns um, that members might have um, in relationship. I think it's always uh, good when uh, when there's a stronger um voice going forward um rather than an, an individual area um other areas could maybe highlight uh, the impacts uh, that they have as well and that can give a, a a stronger um a stronger picture so those are my contributions i hope they help yep yeah th thank you raymond yeah um we look forward to the association of community councils um to see if we can sort the problem out but uh, uh, I think there's some of the community councils get a written report prior to the meeting. Uh, you know, I think they would they would appreciate that as well, uh, some form of written report um, prior to the meeting. Right? Um, yeah, Chair, in terms yes. of the written report, so if an officer is not able to attend a community council, they should be receiving a written report. Uh, if that's not happening, uh, we'll look at that uh, to try and get that done. But that should be happening as a as a minimum, there should be a written report going to the councils. Uh, but uh, myself and Stephen will look at that off after the meeting and see what can be done to improve that. But I would say the, uh, the association, me and you're talking about maybe a, a good compromise, as Councillor Brenner has, has said, to get that uh, input into the local inspector. Um, in terms of police stations, Councillor Brenner's right, we, we obviously did have to uh, review buildings. Uh, efficient use of the buildings we had and uh, some did close but that obviously the, there's an input or a potential for input into the local policing review that uh, Inspector Mezzles mentioned uh, earlier. Okay, thanks. Um, Jan, is, you want to yeah. raise point? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to agree with Raymond Bremner. Maybe the police attendant at the Association of Community Councils is a great, um, you know, um, point to make because there is a shortage of police resources and some of these community councils are only four or five people at them these smaller ones anyway so if there was going to the association that'd be fine unless any of the bigger community councils because there's a couple of big ones and there was really something that was really you know an issue that they really wanted clarifying up maybe if someone you know come along you know once a quarter to one of these meetings if, if it was required regarding the review of the police stations i know a lot of them are closed but a lot of them are closed in the little villages and whatnot but towns with greater populations it really is imperative we have the police stations um hours extended um because well for wick is a royal borough and it has sitting with a court in it and the police station's not open. That's quite a joke in this day and age, you know, really, in all honesty. We have a court with a sheriff sitting uh, 15 days out of 20, and we have a police station that's not open 24 7. Really? You know, it's just um, something to bear in mind when the review comes along. Thanks. Okay, Jan, thanks very much. Jan, and I'm, I'm sure you'll take on board that uh, as part of the review. Important points there. Right, if, uh, Jan, is that? I, thank you. I think that's everything. So the um, the committee is invited to note the progress made against the objective set within the Highland Local Policing Plan 2023, year two, and we've gone through the report. And are we happy to note the contents? Not seeing anybody. Noted. Disagreeing there. Yeah. So we will note that. We'll now move on to item number five, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Local Performance Report. And just before I um, ask Paddy 
uh, to give it. I, I wish to convey our deepest condolences to the family and the colleagues of Scottish Fire and Rescue Firefighter Barry Martin. This terrible tragedy is a reminder of what our brave firefighters face while doing their job. So over to Paddy. Thank you very much, Chair. Excuse me and good morning elected members. Uh, I believe my camera may have be frozen, uh, but hopefully you can all hear me. Um, thank you very much, Chair, for your for your kind words there. Um, as stated, I am Station Commander Paddy Farrell and I will be here this morning to deliver uh, the SFRS's uh, performance report for quarter three, 2022-23 for Keith Ness. Uh, first of all, if, if I could direct uh, the members attention to section 3.2 of the report. During the reporting period, SFRS crews supported by our community safety advocates in Keith Ness uh, continue to provide a range of prevention and engagement activities, including home fire safety visits and school visits. Crews at Thurso Fire Station have run a very successful fire skills course, uh, which saw seven local young people complete an eight week course covering everything from team building, practical firefighting skills and first aid. Plans are underway to run uh, more courses uh, in the future. We also have uh, the youth volunteer scheme continuing to run at Wick Fire Station, and this is attended by pupils from Wick and Thurso High Schools. If we move to section 3.3 of the report, uh, during the reporting period, we attended one accidental dwelling fire and one deliberate fire in a non-domestic setting. There Thankfully, there were no fire fatalities or casualties during the reporting period. During the reporting period, we attended two road traffic collision incidents. Uh, unfortunately, one of these incidents resulted in two people losing their lives and our thoughts are with the families and loved ones of the deceased. Uh, moving to section 3.4 of the report, uh, SFRS continues to actively deliver and refine its on-call retain duty system and volunteer duty system, recruitment and training processes to meet national and local requirements. Key stations and communities are targeted across the Caithness area and SFRS promotes campaigns with its partner agencies through local media and key community contacts and continued local area support is requested for recruitment for Dunbeath Fire Station and Leipster Community Response Unit. I would also like to take this opportunity to update the elected members on the recruitment situation for Thurso Fire Station. Uh, we have experienced staff and challenges at Thurso Fire Station during quarter three. However, in January, two staff have completed their initial breathing apparatus training and the, to, uh, to update on the appliance availability, uh, average appliance availability for Thurso's second appliance for January 2023 has increased to 41%. And so far in February, that availability has again increased to 70%. Three new entrants have today begun their initial training for Thurso, as in that they've started their initial two week training course for Thurso Fire Station. And we have another four applicants that are at various stages in the recruitment process. With these new entrants and further training, we hope to see that availability increase even further. I'd like to thank the elected members for their support with our recruitment and our prevention efforts and I'd be happy to take any questions on the submission this morning. Thank you. OK, Paddy, thank you very much. That, that, that's really encouraging news about the, the staffing levels there. It's something we've discussed before and I was a bit concerned about the turnout for the second second appliance, but if we're up at 70%, that, 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 that's very good. Yeah, that, that's good news for, for, for Thursha. I can open up now to any other members. Not seeing any hands coming up. Oh, sorry, Janet, Jan. Yeah, thanks, Paddy, and thanks for this report. And it's, um, what you've said is a very, very positive report, and your recruitment seems to be going really, really well. And I know the thing, you, uh, the the training you have with the youth over here in WEC has been extremely, extremely well and very positive. So that might be some. Um, firefighters of the future, which is really, really good. And just to reiterate what Ron says, I mean, you are yourselves and the police are the heroes of the, you know, the service. And uh, we, we can't thank you enough for what you do. He's, um, that, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Um, Wally, you've got your hand up there. 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. Always a very interesting report indeed, and well done to the fire service. Can I just ask a brief question? Because I've done this myself. How is the uptake on the interlinked fire alarms going in households? Or have you any idea? Thank you, Councillor Mackay. Um, sorry, what, what do you mean by the update? Sorry, just to clarify. So the uptake, sorry, uptake. Oh, sorry, uptake. uptake. Sorry, I thought you meant yeah, update. Sorry, 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 yes. Uptake on the um, interlinked fire alarms, which are very effective indeed. I've got one myself. It's very, very good. One. Even the shower will put it all off. However, yeah. Thank you, buddy. Well, we still have um, people coming forward to us uh, that, that we would who would request uh, assistance either in if they're fit, depending on the sort of obviously the if it's if somebody if somebody say for example owns their own home, it's really down to the to the homeowner um, to to ensure that these respond that these new smoke alarms are fitted. Uh, we still have people coming forward to us for advice to ask on about siting or what types of alarms to buy, uh, and even if it's just for gen general home fire safety advice, um, we we do have a, a very limited number of. Uh, Heart interlink detectors that we can provide to people in certain circumstances, um, but but we do still have people coming forward to us asking for advice, and more than happy to if anybody has any queer questions or queries, um, we are still here. We we we're please get, just get in touch with us if if there are any questions. Thanks, thanks, buddy. Yeah. Is there um, any other members got any points for the for the fire report? Nope. Not seeing anything going up, so uh, we have we have uh, commented on it and scrutinised it, and uh, we, we we certainly note the the contents there. Thanks very much, Paddy. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, just uh, just to thank uh, Councillor uh, McEwen for the, her kind words. Thank you, and again for yourself, uh, Chair, for your kind words there just at the start. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, we move on now to item six. I just wonder if um, um, Peter is actually here. Yes, Raymond. Yes. Oh, sorry, there he is. Yeah, Raymond, would you want to come in there to see your hand up? Yeah, if you don't mind, um, I'll put it in the chat just for noting on it on this item. Um, I'm uh, the councillor that's on the uh, Focus North group, um, and um, so I'm just uh, declaring a connection to it. But uh, I don't believe that it amounts to me having to declare an interest in this item. Um, I think this, yeah, I think folks will realise this is just an update um, for questions and inquiry. Thanks. Thank, thanks. Yes, that, that's that's fine, Raymond. Right, welcome, Peter. How are you doing today? <laughs> You're you're on mute, Peter. There. Sorry, I'm uh, I'm perched in a, a side office here. Uh, oh, yes. Good morning. How are you? It's, it's all uh, handing all over to you now. So let, looking forward to this presentation. Right. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So um, if you give me a second, I will endeavour to. Um, so here we go. And hopefully, if I do that, I'm hoping that you can see that as a full screen presentation. I'm not seeing anything at the moment. Okay, well, it's showing very two seconds. Let me try again. Give me a second while you get yourselves and then. Is that now? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's nothing there. We we did receive the report, the Focus North Partnership report, Peter. Is that what you were going to go through? Uh, which I've actually, yeah. So it's a it's a, just a brief presentation. Yeah. Um, Peter, which, if you say if you want to send the presentation to me, I'll try and share it from this end if that'll help. It's it's actually it's the the two documents that I sent you, Mac. It's the there's a PowerPoint. For some reason, this is just deciding that. Bear with bear with me. Um, but I can quickly send you this again. I don't understand why this is not sharing. It says it's sharing, but yes, that's the the wonders of Teams. Oh, something's happening. Oh, okay. Is that now? Can you see it now? Yes, we, we've got something here. Is that what you're looking for? 
Is it is it focus north presentation to Caithness County Committee? That's the one. Okay, sorry, just, Max, panic averted for some reason. Okay, just floating, again, and it's floating. Sorry, folks. Okay, it was just um, this is a brief presentation. Um, it's an update on um, on the work that's been going on uh, that I've already spoken to you about a couple of times. Um, and as Raymond was saying earlier, he's um, been heavily involved in the advisory board side of of setting out how that part of the partnership is going to work. So I'm just going to talk you through a little bit of the um, where we are and and just what I'm seeking from from you today. Um, just a recap, and again, I'm going to be quick with this because it should be old news to folks. But um, the Caithness North Sutherland Regeneration Partnership, which was established back in about 2007, has been the main um, collaborative body working in the in the Caithness North Sutherland area and amongst the partners of Highland Council, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, the Caithness Chamber of Commerce. The Dunray site in its various guises, it was um, a, a parent body organisation up until last year and now it's back in the NDA fold. Um, the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority itself, Skills Development Scotland, Scottish Government and now formally joined us also is um, UHI North Highland. So, we've, so, th so those are the bodies involved in the partnership. And when it was originally established, it was very much focused on um, on the, the threat of Dunray decommissioning and the effect on that, what that was going to have in the area. And it, its focus was very much about trying to maintain and um, ensure that the GDP and, and employment in the area was continued uh, whilst that happened. Um, in the last, well, that's now 15 years, a lot of things have changed. As I mentioned previously, um, the Dunray site has now been brought back in house, so it was 10 years under a private um, contract. It's now been brought back in, into the NDA and is currently going through a, a revision of its um, what's effectively its, its work its work plan for the for the future years, and that's going through a process at the moment. Um, which will be you know, seeking formal government approval, et cetera. So that, that's changed. We've obviously had Brexit. We've had um, cl declared climate emergency. Um, we've had um, a COVID pandemic. So there's been a, a huge amount of change in, in, the, in the world in that period. And so we, the board decided that it was time for us to have another look again at what um, CNSRP as was, was was doing and how the partners worked together. So since about June time last year, we've been through a process which we've engaged with with um, yourselves, both in, in as um, so both the Caithness councillors and the Sutherland councillors and also a lot of other stakeholders and, and interested parties. And that process has now largely come to an end in terms of the of the process, and that's what I just wanted to seek your um, uh, endorsement and support of today. So, the new approach we've come with is is um, our partnership goals are are much more concentrating on maximising the immediate benefits from current opportunities, and and perhaps less focus on what the um, Dunray decommissioning program. Uh, it is being it'll have to be built in of course to everything that we're doing but um, we're much more focused on what the immediate opportunities are we're setting ourselves three-year goals around economic growth people and communities and sustainability and also our um, just how the partnership works together and we've also been through and looked very carefully at how the partnership works and how partners need to work together to achieve the goals that we're setting ourselves and a, as a result of that we've set out a detailed charter um, we've got some a common vision and goals and we're in the process of identifying key performance indicators so that we can measure and um, progress against those we agreed a new identity and you, you'll see it there focus north after quite a lot of discussion and consultation and why did we pick that? 
Um, well, a few key points really. We think it's much more memorable than the Caithness and North Sutherland Regeneration Partnership. Um, it's talking about focusing rather than regeneration, which I almost felt slightly um, suggested there was something that needed to be fixed, which is not the case. And uh, so it states our intents and it asks, and more, uh, almost more importantly, asks others to look here. Um, it complements existing initiatives such as Venture North, and it's descriptive but not proscriptive about the boundary. So um, whilst we're still concentrating on largely the same geography, we're not quite as um, as hide bound by the by the the actual physical geography. We're more interested in communities of interest as well as communities of geography. Okay, so that um, hopefully takes you through uh, the history of why we've got here. I'm, I'm not going to go through this in any great detail, just to say that there is, um, which you've already seen, um, effectively that's a one page statement of what the partnership has agreed it's for and what it's going to try and do. So it's talking about it being action centred, so it's about driving opportunities. Um, it's talking about making a difference. It's and, and key points here are that it's seeking to have us acting more as a single team rather than a series of disparate, uh, disparate organisations or separate organisations. And that we're going to set some very specific goals around our economic growth, people and communities, partnership effectiveness and sustainability. Um, and the, where we're currently at is the master plan development a part of this. And what I think is going to become clear is that we'll be concentrating on a smaller number of more in-depth activities. And rather than trying to do lots of things in lots of different areas, we're going to concentrate our efforts on a, on a smaller number of, of really important factors um, because we recognise that the resources available to us are diminishing. I say us collectively as, as partners, you know, public sector funding is, is under pressure and, and every organisation has less people and time and, and money to do things. So that effectively sets out um, what we're going to do. And then really importantly, and this is part of the endorsement I'm seeking from you is that um, that we have agreed a partnership charter. The, uh, the executive board has agreed that this is the way that we're going to work together. And again, I'm not going to read it in great detail, but it sets out a series of things that we're committed to to work together as partners. And I'll, I'll just point you again at, uh, at, the, at the bottom there saying we're going to act as one team. And so we're going to be driving our efforts to maximise our um, impact. And so what I'm just asking for from the Council um, this morning, from uh, this committee, is um, to endorse an approach, that, and this approach and the Council's commitment to it, um, and to be in general in support of the partnership goals and prioritisation, and that going forward, that um, uh, this committee will be part of helping engaging and setting the goals and reviewing progress against it. OK, that was a bit of a canter through, but I hope that sets the, um, the scene and obviously any questions I'm happy to answer. Yes, Peter, thank you very much. I think a really important one there is for everybody working together. Um, I'll bring Carl in now, his hands up. Thanks, Roland. Good morning, Peter. Good to see you. Good morning, Carl. Good to see you too. Good, Peter. I, yeah, more than more than glad to endorse and support what's being presented here. Um, you know, we've we've had significant discussion in the past on, on how we what we felt would be positive change from what was CNSRP, and uh, I was pleasantly. Uh, encouraged to read the document that you produced so you know and, and you've highlighted again in your own presentation what the opportunities are so uh, absolutely going in the right direct, uh, direction um it really strikes you to just the, uh, the scale and the level of imminent development in our area you know there's a lot to be excited about 
Yeah, and I think that provides a lot of validity to to reports claim that our area can be a leader and and you know in a transformation to a low carbon economy, and then uh, creating a circular economy, which always excites me. Um, so I think uh, you know the opportunities around that are fantastic. And you also, I think, you know, it, when it captures the fact that we we need to leverage uh, renewable energy production and consumption, and then um, some of there's always a debate in, in our localities improving of uh, benefits. And and what does what does community benefit mean? It can mean a range of things, but I think we've got an opportunity to to uh, develop that, uh, develop and define exactly what it means and improve the opportunities around it with uh, renewable energy. So very much look forward to that. I think uh, the important thing is also on um, how we improve uh, relationships with external stakeholders. And I know that recently um, Highland Council have committed to arranging some workshops for uh, members in and around the, the incorporated changes for the national planning framework there's there's some really uh, exciting stuff around them and i'll go back to the point about community benefits being one you know so that was never a material consideration but now we've got an opportunity to to you know discuss and and, and redefine how we how we do things so you know i, I really look forward to all these things uh, and it's always good to to understand just how keen and I you've got on expanding uh, partnerships. So I think we're in a really good place. Uh, one question I had, Peter, was when in, uh, I forget what section it's in, but when where are we here? Target sectors. So you quite rightly, you, you know, you've got space, offshore wind, tidal, tidal generation, hydrogen, future transport, uh, natural capital, and, and tourism. But I don't see a reference to onshore wind now. Whatever, whatever our opinions on onshore wind is, uh, I think there are some, you know, we've got a lot of work to do, uh, but uh, I think, personally, I think from my experience that we're pushing a, an open door with the uh, onshore and offshore uh, uh, generators and, and, and companies, so it would just uh, just be a missed opportunity, I think. But good to get your, your feedback yeah. up here where we are. So, Peter, thanks again. I'm very happy to to provide the support at Jasper. Thanks, Carl. Uh, if I can, um, Chairman, if I can go back uh, to that. Uh, yeah, the onshore wind is absolutely in our thinking. I mean, if you look at what, um, I think there's sometimes a perception that there's there's not much employment as a result of onshore wind. And I think we, um, uh, that's a piece of work that we need to do to understand that industry better, because I do think there actually is more employment than we, than we necessarily think. Um, there's also more opportunity um, here in that uh, if you look at um, potential for hydrogen production, potential for power storage for load balancing, but also for um, grid stabilization activities that are pieces of equipment that could be attached to existing farms with very little footprint impact that will require both investment, so you know, money being spent on people building things, um, and uh, potentially employment because these things need to be maintained. And um, uh, I, you know, so I think there's a, there's there's that side of the industry. There's also there's if, whether we um, aware of it or not, but there's also a lot of activity going on around grid expansion, reinforcement, and and so on, and all of that requires people to do work and I think the, the bit I'm really keen that we do is that we make sure that as much of that as possible is based here rather than being imported to do some work and then going back away again and I think we, we you know so really getting into understanding how certain parts of this sector work I think gives us the opportunity to 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 see if we can attract some you know for example, workshops where they're doing maintenance, why couldn't they be based here if they've got potentially 10 customers? So I, th I think it's a, it's a very exciting uh, time for us. And um, I'm actually just broken off from a workshop where we're, we're talking about the um, talent attraction um, and uh, employment challenges that we've, we've got. And we're trying to do, a, this is one of our first big pieces of work that we're starting on. 
um, to see what we can do to, you know, to increase the, t the availability of people to do this kind of work here locally. Sorry, that was quite a long answer. Um, <coughs> Yeah, th thanks, Peter. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that you're on our side, shall we say? <laughs> and uh, and I know I've been involved with you through doing the stakeholders group, and and it, it's certainly exciting times ahead, shall we say? You know, and we have to make the most of it. Um, Wally, do you want to come in? Oh yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, well done, Peter. Well done. Absolutely fantastic report here for Focus North, and all the very best, all the very best with your launch. Peter, working together, as we all say, is most important. There's no getting away from it. And what reassurance this brings to us all, and to the county, and to Dunry in general. Let's be honest, it's the only way forward for Keith Ness. And let's be, look at the huge infrastructure that's going on now with SAC, for example. It's unbelievable. Peter, just one quick question. Uh, the Cromarty Firth free Freeport announcement, is that on your radar? Yeah. Yeah, yes, of course. I mean, we're absolutely delighted that that has come to the Highlands. I think that, you know, when when you look at the potential competition around the country, it's really great that that's come to the to the Highlands. That's going to have spin-off benefits for the whole region. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it's just it's just yet another exciting thing that's going to happen um, for us. Uh, you know, so um, absolutely on our radar uh, and and Giles. Hubie, who's uh, is in works for our um, in the delivery group, is also sits on the um, the steering committee for that. So we're we're very much connected to it. Yeah, and we're looking forward to to seeing how that um, helps to to attract more investment into the region. Thanks, Peter. Um, Matthew, if you put your hand up. Yeah, morning. Peter, I um, have to say before I start, I love your back backdrop. It may not be Keith Ness, but it is very nice. Um, I offer too my full support for the, the new approach, and I think the simplified approach, well, actually, you know what I think. The simplified approach is definitely the way ahead, um, fewer targets, but trying to sort of nail them fully and squarely. Um, a very slightly opportunistic question, but seeing as you're here, um, we have a paper later, don't worry, don't worry. We have a paper later this morning on the WIC PSO, and obviously that's something you've been heavily involved with. Um, this, the paper we have is quite optimistic, um, but I saw a report somewhere in the press last week that was concerned about the numbers. Are you able to give us a 30 second summary on your thoughts, please? Um, well, without knowing the detail of what is being presented to you, it's, it's difficult for me to, to say. But I would say in general terms, if you look at, um, we have around our coasts, uh, significant opportunities for offshore wind uh, and all of the ports in the in the highlands, but you know, obviously our, our two large ports, um, Scrabster and Wick are going to be vital in making sure that, that, that those uh, wind farms are properly developed and supported. So um, I'm very encouraged that, uh, that that's going to be the case. I also know that a lot of the uh, developers have have recognised that they're going to have to invest in onshore as well as offshore um, uh, facilities. So I'm hoping that that you know that will mean the opportunity for our, our, you know our region to benefit from that as well. Um, sorry, it was it was the airport PSO I was asking about. Oh, I'm sorry. I would say that if you look at the way the, the world has gone in terms of the way aviation has changed, um, a lot of patterns have changed in the way that businesses are, are for example, traveling. And I think the approach that's being taken on the PSO and WIC has, is adapting to that. And I think it's working, it's, it's working well from that point of view, it's understanding that. And, and so being fleet of foot and, and adapting to the new circumstances I think are, is good and I'm very encouraged for, in my conversations with uh, David Swanson for example um, that, that that is going to continue to go from strength to strength as uh, as as time passes and we, we recognize that we're going to have to adapt to you know different modes of travel you know people are traveling differently there's more leisure less business and I think it's um we just need to ex you know accept the world as it is and, and adapt to it I'm encouraged. I don't know if that helps. Yes, it does. It encourages me. Thank you. Yeah. 
OK, thanks. Uh, Raymond, you've got your hand up there. Yeah, um, I and, um, and before we get to that item and because it's raised its head here, um, I should say that uh, I have a connection to that item. I've got connections all over the place to the items in, the, in, in this paper this morning. Um, I am appointed by the council on that uh, committee as well, and I am the chair of the WIC John the Groats Airports um, uh, committee. And I think that uh, in answer to Matthew's question to Peter, um, I hope you don't mind Peter me coming in on this one, but the um, that report has been requested. I've re requested that report to come to this committee. Um, so that members do get an update on it, but it is a very fluid position, just as Peter uh, referred to there just now. And uh, I think in terms of the fluid, uh, the fluidity of it, the PSO subgroup that is look that is caught, that meets very regularly. Um, Peter, you're aware of that, and uh, and it has to look at the the circumstances. It has to look at the 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 data that we are constantly being fed, and we're also having to look. Um, at the uh, at the information that we're getting from the airlines, I think that uh, it's fair to say that you know, and and amongst it all, we have to be pr pragmatic, and I'll state that we have to be pragmatic in in how we review um, the position of the PSO going forward, and that is something that is um, I'm glad to say that the council, um, led uh, by uh, David Swanson, is reviewing uh, often enough and quickly enough. So that at least if it's requiring adaptation, then we are able to move that uh, uh, quickly in terms of what options are available uh, to the uh, to the PSO group. Um, and I think that uh, so what Matthew was talking about in terms of um, any information conflicting um, the paper that we have today, we have to look at all of that on balance. And I think David will probably speak to that when he uh, talks to that paper later on in the in, in the meeting. Thanks. Yep. So thank you, Raymond. Yeah, we'll look forward to hearing from David uh, a bit later. Has uh, um, sorry, Jan, you got your hand up. Yeah, thank you, and thank you very much, Peter. Um, you've made this a lot, a lot more <laughs> simplified for me. <laughs> Coming new to this this sort of topic, um, you've actually simplified it an awful lot for me, and I can understand it now. And um, the name Focus North. It's much more simpler and easier to remember. And I think um, it's very, very exciting for Caithness and Sutherland. And I I want I am looking forward to working with you for the next three years. Your strategy and your objectives are very easy to understand. And I thank you very much on my behalf for that. Thank you. And I'm happy to endorse it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, anybody else got any comments at all? Not seeing any other hands going up. Thanks, Peter. That that was really okay. really enlightening. Yeah, certainly. Was. If we can if we can just jump in and just one yes. last plug. Um, yes. The formal launch event is on Wednesday. I know a lot of you are probably booked along that. It's it's now fully booked, which we're we're really pleased about. And um, but it will also be streamed online. So um, that that will be sending out a link to it to the world tomorrow. Um, so it's going to be an online um, activity uh, just to, you know, those who are coming. I look forward to seeing you and we look forward to using that as a platform to promote our opportunities in the region. Yes, that, that, that's really good to hear. That it's fully booked and I uh, look forward to, to see, seeing you there. Uh, I'm sure other members will be there. Now, we have to um, note the recent review and rebranding of the Focus North Partnership and more importantly, agree to support for the, for, <coughs> sorry, for the Focus North Master Plan, which uh, with all the comments, I would say that um, we, we are agreeing to support it, and the structure and the Council's role in the partnership. And uh, it's important that we realise our role in supporting this, and I certainly would be right behind it. And um, if we can get agreement there, from the other members on that. Agreed. I'm not seeing anybody. Agreed. 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 Okay, and I think from the comments that were made to the from from the people that we are in agreement with that. So we're 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 quite glad to agree that then for you, Peter. Yes, and, and thank you very much for the, the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. okay. Goodbye.
OK, now we'll move on to item seven. I'm, I'm proposing to have maybe a wee comfort break after this item. If uh, you're in agreement with that, uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, just a, a, a quick comfort break. Yes, okay. thank you. Definitely yeah. agreed. Good. Good. Um, so the community regeneration funding assessment of applications. Uh, there is a report there, item three, and I think is it Sarah that's um, going to take us through it? Hey, thanks, Chair, and morning, members. Um, I'll just give you a brief background into the uh, papers that have been put forward to committee. Uh, so the Community Regeneration Fund is an umbrella term uh, for a number of funds that are available to organisations to access in Highland. It comprises of the Highland Coastal Communities Fund and the Place-Based Investment Programme, both of which are Scottish Government funding streams to support sustainable development in Highland. Um, area committees are awarded devolved allocations according to approved formula and decision making on which projects should receive funding sits with elected members. Um, within Caithness, the following allocations are available for distribution. Um, so the Highland Coastal Communities Fund, we have £398,650.52 and, and the Place-Based Investment Programme is £153,360 and that gives us a total funds available of £552,010.52. And um, so there are 16 applications under consideration today um, with grants grant requests totaling £565,612.11. And um, but please note there is a typo in the committee papers presented uh, which means the figures included in the report is £10,000 uh, out. Um, the committee paper states um, a figure of uh, £556,000, uh, but it's uh, just to confirm as well that the figure given on the RAG assessment summary sheet is the correct figure of the £565,000. Um, so I've undertaken a technical assessment of all the projects and I can confirm that all projects brought to members today are technically eligible. Um, I've also provided a RAG assessment of the key criteria to help members in their considerations. Um, I would note that the RAG assessment is undertaken on information that's been provided to us by the applicant during the application process, where a project has been awarded red or amber against the criteria. Um, just to highlight that this doesn't reflect an eligibility issue, but it does flag up that there's outstanding concerns. Um, for example, this could be around match funding or uh, consents that are still pending. Uh, or also that only brief information was provided with the application. So if members wish to approve the projects that have red or amber ratings, then we would usually seek to address these concerns by applying uh, technical conditions to any funding awards made. Um, so members are asked to decide whether to approve, defer or reject applications under consideration and in the case of approvals to agree the grant award amount and any conditions of funding they wish to attach over and above what would be our technical conditions um, which will attach arising from our assessments. Um, and as members are aware within the umbrella of community regeneration funding, we also administer the community led local development funds on behalf of the strategic uh, local action group. Um, we have since met with the LAG who have agreed final uh, grant awards for project from the current year's allocation and this represents a total investment to projects in the Caithness area of £85,436. Um, four projects were approved under that and three of them today go forward for a match funding request from the area committee. Um, those are Thursday Youth Club and uh, Friends of the North Bass and the Caithness Mental Health Group. Um, and as per the recommendations for consideration, we have a request from Wick Whitechapel Toilets Project, which was previously approved under the Highland Coastal Communities Fund. Um, I appreciate that uh, the funds are oversubscribed today. However, if there's any balance of area funds remaining, members are asked to consider an uplift of funding to this project. Um, Debbie Sutton has provided me with an update um, to say that the works went out to tender in December and the material costs have significantly risen. Um, so it's come in around about 50% higher than the QS estimates, um, taking the project costs to 430,000. 
Um, this means there's a funding shortfall of 241,000 against the previously secured funding package. Um, so therefore, a top up request has been made um, to bid for any available funds through the Community Regeneration Fund Caithness Area Budget. Um, and I can confirm an approach has also been made um, to the Highland Council Capital Loan Fund um, for the shortfall. Um, and just to confirm for that, the planning permission and building warrants are in place for that. And as expected, once the full funding package is in place, the works could take around 12 weeks to complete. Um, so that's just a brief introduction. As there's um, 16 applications going forward, I don't know if you want me to introduce them one by one or just hand back to the chair and I can address any questions um, that you have against the RAG assessment summary. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Matthew, you've got your hand up there. Yeah, I wasn't intending to ask this question, but in view of what Sarah's just said, um, by the way, support the, the WIC toilet project. Um, are the other figures we've got, I mean, a 50% increase is, you know, extreme. Are we, can we be confident the other figures more or less are actually still realistic given such a, an enormous increase? I'm just looking for general advice from Sarah, probably. Uh, well, the update from Debbie was that the works have gone to tender. Um, so I would presume there that there has actually been an agreed price that would have a time limited offer on those. Um, but I wouldn't be able to give you any more further detail on that. And um, sorry, sir, it was, I was meaning more generally, um, Chair, for the other the figures for the other projects that were just about to be asked to consider, but not, uh, not, okay. the, WIC, not the WIC one specifically. OK, um, we have found that especially under um, projects approved under the, the coastal previous Coastal Communities Fund, um, that material costs were going up and that's just been you know, a problem across the board. Um, yeah. But within our application process, we do ask that um, costs are based on recent quotes received. Um, and for the majority of the projects they have, and we address this under the value for money criteria, if they have been based on, on accurate quotes received. Um, okay. So it is something that, um, you know, each project is going to have to um, work to, you know, get projects underway quickly that there isn't going to be Absolutely. these fluctu fluctuation in costs. Thank you very much. OK, uh, they, all the applicant application forms were circulated among the, the members. Um, Ray, Raymond, are you wanting to come in there? Yeah, uh, first of all, um, thanks, Sarah. The, the power of work that you've done with this and also the previous conversations, the supporting conversations that you've had with members and the reviews that have been uh, undertaken to be able to get uh, this report to this stage at Caithness Area Committee is to be commended. I particularly think that the way that you've uh, approached it and the way that members have approached it has been equitable, um, especially as referred to in your report where we have um, set out criteria that match fund uh, certain criteria that uh, really should be supported and that is um, where um, uh, supporting um, funds or match funding of uh, a certain uh, amount has been um, identified and where the sustainability of the project has been uh, qualified um, and, and, other, and other points as well. In terms of the Whitechapel Road um, uh, public uh, toilets facility, I think that's uh, well known to members. I um, appreciate what Matthew said there just now. Um, and, we, and that again has been a fluid, um, a, a, a fluid assessment that's ongoing. You're right, it's based on tenders, based on up-to-date information, um, and and it's, it's massively supported by the public as well. It's one of those um, it's one of those um, projects that everybody in the community has said that they've been wanting for over the past two, three, four years. So um, yeah, the, the the paper that we've got um, in front of us, a lot of the work in terms of determination has been uh, has been undertaken and I and I just wanted to commend you and uh, the team for being able to get the, the project to where it is just now so that we can uh, make those final um, decisions today. Thanks. Thank you, Raymond. I see Jan, you've got your hand up. I just would like to uh, reiterate exactly what Raymond said. 
Okay, thank you very much, Sarah, for all the help you've done in this and getting this together and all the, the meetings you've had with us for the, the decision making and determining of these projects. Um, regarding the Whitechapel one, I mean, I think this is really getting to the urgent stage. So I was quite um, happy to hear that when it starts, it would only take 12 weeks. So um, the sooner it got started, the, the better. But thank you for all your hard work and the whole co uh, committee for uh, this painless process especially for my first time. Thank you. OK, thank, thanks for that. Um, Willie? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you. Yes, uh, Sarah, well done indeed. 522,000. This is a very detailed report indeed. And I, like all the other councillors, have gone through this in detail. And what impresses me most with the six applications is the variety, the variety of throughout the applications and the work that has gone in within each group that have applied and the detail. This is also a testament to the Caithness community striving to do their best, which enhances the county as a whole. And let's be honest, it makes it a, a perfect place to come and live. So yeah, well done to everybody. It's a tremendous, tremendous report this. And I certainly support the uplift as well. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Sorry, I was on mute there. Uh, thank, thank you, Willie. Thanks for that. Is there anybody else wanting to make any contributions there at all? Members? I was just actually going to say that the people that weren't successful this time, maybe with a wee bit more evidence, they could be encouraged to come back next time. OK, we'll see if the applications come in again. Um, uh, thanks, Sarah, for, for that uh, really good report. I must say it's excellent. Um, I, I take it now that we would just uh, consider the, all the applications presented uh, for funding and agree whether to approve, defer or reject the application. Um, are we in agreement to ag agree the, the, the applications? Agreed, yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Um, I think at this moment in time, the funds are oversubscribed, um, so I think it would probably be best to go through each project um, yeah. individually and members can consider whether they um, approve, uh, decline or defer. Yep. Yeah. OK, OK, so sorry, 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 Sarah. Yeah, sorry, Sarah. Raymond was, oh, sorry, yeah. OK, Sarah, do you want to quickly go through each one or? Uh, yes, I mean the the information is is there in front of uh, members, so I think perhaps it would be easier if I just introduce each project and members can give their thoughts. The RAG assessment um, summary spreadsheet is ranked in um, a descending order of the the RAG assessment uh, scoring. Um, so the first is um, the Thurso Community uh, Cafe and their second chance project. So this project is to lease a premises and purchase of a van, um, along with salary costs to set up a repair, reuse and recycle initiative for the local community. Um, so as you can see, the application has scored red um, on several of the, the RAG assessment scoring criteria. Um, so there we have red for project robustness. Um, this was because of the lack of detail regarding the project planning and delivery, um, and particularly how the project will be financially stable, uh, sustainable. Um, so it doesn't give con confidence towards uh, that the project is robust. Um, the applicant um, has not re addressed the feedback previously given um, at um, EOI stage towards how the project will complement other similar activity happening in the area. Um, the application itself has provided little evidence of community engagement and support, so only one letter of support was provided on behalf of the Trade Union Council. Um, there has been no detail provided on how the project will be financially sustainable, um, so this was a concern given that the funding request includes uh, significant lease costs and salary costs, so it's difficult how to uh, determine how running costs would be covered in future. Um, the applicant has stated that the income generated through small donations, but it does not address fully the sustainability of the project. Um, and just to highlight that they have 
uh, £2,500 match funding confirmed, but they are awaiting the outcome of other applications. Um, but we don't have an idea of when the decision outcome uh, is for that. Um, and next on the list is the Ray Golf Club. Um, so this is for the green keeping and coaching yeah, facility. Sure, can I just interrupt you there? Yep, yeah, sure. Raymond, sorry, no. I was wondering if we were going to be doing them one by one or if um, Sarah was going to go uh, give an assessment of each of them and then we were going to apply. Maybe I could get clarification on that, Sarah. Thanks. Uh, I can do however uh, members would wish. It probably would be easier to go through it one by one and get members' views as we go through. OK, Sarah, that's fine. Is you want then, Raymond come back? Uh, and then, I'll, then, I'll come, then I'll come in because that's what I thought we were going to be doing. Um, I've, I've made mention before that um, projects that are red rag um, are not projects that I, I believe that the committee should be supporting. We've set out a criteria and I think we need to be uh, we need to stick to that. It uh, is unfortunate that um, you know some are not going to see um, their projects come to fruition through the use of this uh, fund. But I think that that's the we have to be quite robust and uh, hold to the criteria that's stated and uh, a red dragged um a consideration is not one i would be looking to support thanks thank you for that raymond anybody else want to contribute no so we move to reject that one then is that agreed, an agreement? agreed. An agreement? Yeah. yeah yeah i'm in agreement with that can i just add okay. chair i i i i support what raymond's just said as a general principle because if we I think if we deferred from that it would then be, we could get mired in a minefield of how enough we do justify or not yeah. accept applications but or I hate putting myself in a straitjacket but on this one I think I, I agree with Raymond's thinking. I agree with Raymond's thinking as well. Chair. Okay thank you I think we're in agreement with that then. <laughs> yes. Okay Sarah we'll move on to the next one. Okay, the next one is Ray Golf Club, and this is for their greenkeeping and coaching facility. Um, so this project is uh, to replace sev several dilapidated buildings and containers with a purpose-built steel frame building, um, which will provide a new greenkeeping facility. Um, so the plans have been drawn up by architects. Um, we have ranked it red um, for several reasons. Um, so first of all the application states that the organization has constituted group status um, so this status is typically typically for organization with small financial obligations and um, so we would have quite serious legal concerns awarding an organization significant funding um, without a formal or uh, organization registration so what we would be looking for there is for the applicant to uh, be a registered charity or a, a limited company status and um, so if members were minded to approve this project we would um, have to stipulate that as a condition of funding um, planning permission has been granted um, and a building warrant will be applied for once a funding package is in place. Um, they have received letters of support from the Caithness Junior Golf Partnership and the Scottish Golf North. Um, it would be expected in relation to the level of funding uh, requested here that there would be more substantial evidence of engagement and support for the project. Um, that would usually be in the in the way of uh, community consultation or, or letters, letters of support from local um, organisations. Um, a development plan has been provided, however, a business plan would be expected for the level of investment and the nature of the project to demonstrate demand and financial sustainability. Um, so there is a, a lack of evidence there for demand for this project. Um, and with regards to legacy, um, the, the question hasn't been answered fully within the, the application. Um, and also, they haven't um, acknowledged previously previous fund, uh, feedback given regarding match funding being in place. So there is significant match funding totaling 108,000 uh, still to be applied for, although options have been identified. Um, so that could take a, a significant time to get that match funding um, in place. 
um, where we usually expect projects to start within um, three months of um, Community Regeneration Fund grant award. Um, and it's also worth noting as well that um, this would be considered phase one. Um, so what the funding request is for here is for a green keeping facility. Um, so there really is probably considered to be a limited um, wider community benefit here. Um, although the second phase of the project would be to install a coaching facility within the building. OK, thank you, Sarah. Um, Carl, you put your hand up. Lane Raymond. Ron, my sincere apologies. I should have had a declaration of interest in this matter because I'm a, a club member. So look, I'll absent myself from any participation. OK. OK, uh, thank you, Carl. Raymond. Thanks very much, um, Sarah. Uh, for me, we've already stated the, uh, a lot of the criteria that we would uh, like to, uh, to have uh, applications assessed against. This one also read uh, uh, rags red. Uh, for me, we need to be um, uh, equitable in terms of our application of the process. And for that, that would mean for me, I would be moving to refuse the, this application. Thanks very much. Thank you, Raymond. Anybody else want to make any comment? I'm with Raymond on this one. Okay, thanks, Jan. So if there's no other, I propose that we reject this one. I don't think there's Okay, Sarah, thanks for that. Okay, uh, the next one is the Caithness Clicks project. Um, so this is to employ three sessional workers to cover Thurso area and two each outreach workers to cover rural schools and um, along with a well-being officer to support young carers and um, the costs there include uh, salaries and the mileage for the outreach, outreach workers. Um, the RAG status is mostly the AMBERS are related to um, just the application not providing detailed information. Um, one to maybe highlight there is the clear legacy and exit strategy um, that mentions the possibility of local wind farm community funds as a potential future funding source. However, the legacy would be um, to provide support and assistance to young, young carers at a particularly difficult time um, where issues um, have been seen to be exacerbated by post-COVID uh, recovery and cost of living crisis. Um, and just to confirm that the they have an application to the Stripster Wind Farm um, and they expect the outcome uh, to be known shortly. Um, but in general, the Ambers there um, are just against not providing uh, a detailed answer within the application form. Thank you, Sarah. Raymond? Yeah, on this one, this um, has uh, followed the same procedure as we've applied to all the others. Um, we've identified that there's a that this would actually meet a really good need within the community and it qualifies um, in terms of the RAG assessment. I would move to support this one. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for that one. Um, I would support this one as well because it's a very well uh, organisation and uh, obviously lacking a little detail about the funding, but it provides a, an amazing support for young carers. So I'm happy to support this one. Thanks, thanks, Jan, for that. Yes, it's very important when that. Um, has anybody else got any comments? Carl? Yes, Carl. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was it repeating any comments or any main supportive, uh, Rob? Thank you. OK, we'll put forward then that we support this one. Unless anybody's got any other thoughts. Oh, coming up there. Sarah, thanks. OK, uh, next one is the Friends of the North Baths. Um, this is for the repair and maintenance of a historic outdoor saltwater swimming pool um, in Wick. Um, and this would include the repair of damaged steps going into the pool and the walkway from the car park and the viewpoint area. Um, the project is straightforward to deliver. Um, however, a uh, Crown Estate lease is not currently in place for the asset, um, but they are moving forward towards reaching an agreement. 
Um, and just to highlight that that then is tied into um, public liability insurance not being in place until the lease is agreed. Um, they do have their match funding in place. Um, and again, uh, the ambers there are just due to the questions not being fully answered within the application form um, and not so much as regard to the delivery of the project. OK, thank you, Sarah. Uh, come, Raymond. Yeah, on this one, um, thanks, Sarah. I believe that uh, this is a, support, a supportable project that ranks uh, correct. Uh, it ranks well within our uh, RAG system. I would be supporting this one with the, uh, with the caveat and condition of certain uh, uh, certain outcomes, as uh, you've just mentioned there just now, Sarah. So for this, I'd move to support, uh, subject to some of the um, conditions that we that would be um, applied to. It. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you, Raymond. Um, Carl? Yeah, exact same comments for me, so more than happy to support it on that basis. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Carl. Matthew? Similar, and when you just look at that general area of WIC, uh, with the work that's been done there in the last few years, it's um, it's very uplifting and inspiring. So uh, I haven't actually plucked up the courage to go into the North Bath myself yet, but it is, it's a really good project. Thank you. Good for you. Um, Janet? Jan? Yeah, I'm happy to support this one. Sarah, can you remind me what their match funding was again? Uh, they've managed to get 25% match funding from the CLLD fund. Oh, um, that's good. Looking for a 75% request from uh, CRF. Oh, excellent. Um, I'm happy to support this, especially when it was uh, highlighted on the television just the other week. <laughs> which really showed up in very, very good light and it's an asset to WIC, so I'm happy to support that. Thank you. OK, thanks, Jan. Um, anybody else got any more comments? No, I move that we support that but with the conditions as, as mentioned. OK, um, next is Home Start Cape Nest. This is for a volunteer coordinator and a volunteer support officer. Um, to help recruit volunteers to support families who are facing uh, challenging times. Um, the legacy has been ranked amber. Um, this is just due to a limited answer on how the volunteer coordinator post might be sustained beyond the, the funding date. Um, however, the legacy of the project will be that the organisation has increased the number of trained volunteers who will commit their time beyond the project end date. Um, and they have a plan in place to recruit and raise awareness of Home Start within the local community. Um, value for money has been ranked amber. Um, this is just due to there being uh, high travel costs involved in their um, project costs. Um, so it's just difficult to determine value for money um, on that. Um, we would want there to be a condition added there that they have to um, demonstrate the, the volunteer travel costs required. Um, and the other numbers across the board were just because the question hadn't been answered fully within the application um, rather than there being any concerns. OK, thanks, Sarah. Um, Raymond? Yeah, on this one, I um, totally uh, agree with what um, Sarah has said in terms of demonstrating the um, the value for money and the benefit, uh, sorry, the value for money. I think the benefit is without doubt. Um, we don't have to um, question the benefit of this project, but I and I, and I actually think that they will be able to demonstrate um, benefit of outcome for the um, for the travel uh, costs. So for this one, uh, for me, based on uh, the assessment that's been put towards us today and based on what our considerations might be uh, for taking the project forward, I would move to support this one. Thanks. Thank you, Raymond. Jan? Yeah, I would move to support this one as well. It's a very it's a very needed service in this community, in the, the Keith Nest community, um, just with the condition as Sarah has stated about the, the travel costs and the fuel costs. OK, thank you. Um, anybody else want to make a comment on that? Not seeing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree that we should support this one. Thank you. That's true. 
OK, um, Starts the Goal Community Football Pitch. Uh, this is for a series of pitch improvements to bring the Starts the Goal Football Pitch up to safe, safe standards. Um, so the project costs included here are for the excavation, aerification, overseeding and top dressing of sports sand. Um, the, it does have a, a red rank in there for the match funding. Uh, that's just because they are applying for 100% funding from CRF um, and it's uh, difficult to determine value for money given that high level of request. Um, the, this is a, a small committee who would typically be used to fundraising within the local community. Um, so the reason they are applying for the 100% funding is so that the project can get underway and not delayed um, with having to uh, generate the match funding um, through various means. Um, but this is just the first phase of the project. Um, they do intend to apply for further funding um, and they have suggested wind farm uh, applications as well. Um, so the second phase of the project would be to um, install changing rooms in the area as well. Um, so this would just be the first phase to bring the, the pitch up to standard. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Raymond? Yeah, this is uh, this would be a very obvious um, valued asset for the for the local community and the wider community there. I think that you're right to red rag it. Um, we have set a criteria of match funding and we and to me I'm not comfortable um, breaking the um, the consideration that uh, we need match funding. You have said though that this project is time um, is, is time sensitive. So I would be uh, I would support this. Um, with the caveat that at some point, um, as soon as they possibly can, they can demonstrate their ability to at least put some match funding towards it. So um, I, th I think that that for me would uh, get them over the line with this one. Uh, if they can demonstrate that they can, um, you know, uh, get themselves sorted for even the smallest amount of match funding, uh, the overall benefit to the community uh, for me uh, outweighs that. But uh, given the fact that we've set that criteria for uh, match funding, I think that needs to be qualified. But let's give them the time to do that. So until they uh, until they manage to get that, uh, it's time sensitive. sensitive. Um, I'll propose to uh, award this, um, given it's uh, subject to the uh, condition I mentioned there just now. Thanks. Thank you, Raymond. Um, Carl? Yeah, more than happy to support what Raymond's proposed there. So yes, glad to approve. Okay, fine, thanks. Jan? I would just say, given, we're given, given the previous criteria of the, the red, red in the rag system, um, I would be happy to defer this one until they could get some match funding. Okay, Jan. Any, anybody else got any thoughts? Raymond, do you want to come back in? Yes. Uh, Given the comments from Jan there just now, I wonder if Jan could consider um, the fact that they've said that it's time sensitive, uh, deferring it might actually not um, allow them to, to move forward with it. So I'm just wondering if the project might fail because of the time sensitivity. So maybe uh, caveating it with the fact that if, it, if we can get, allow them to get on with this, they can demonstrate the match funding um, within a period of time. Um, and that's the reason I was uh, saying, you know, that that would be my caveat. So give it, deferring it may actually be more damaging to them um, than allowing them to demonstrate that they can, uh, if they get this over the line with the funding that we've got there, they could actually, um, that could actually give them the time to um, actively uh, show that they can get match funding and maybe not have to draw down the whole amount that we're prepared to award. Thanks. Thanks, Raymond. Wally? Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Yeah, my laptop has been playing up this last half hour. <laughs> Here we are. Yes, yeah, Staxlinger Football Club. I know this football pitch. I passed it the other day. Every football pitch in county is great. They're very much admired. This one is needing to be revamped because it's not all that looking, all that good looking, and it needs to, as much as they can get into it as quick as possible, the better. And this is a football team that's doing very well across the county. They really are thriving and making some great, credible scores. So yeah, the quicker they can get on with this, the better. So I, I would uh, no, I wouldn't like to defend it. I would just like to see them give ahead and go ahead because they are a go ahead team and they need that extra facilities to enhance the the pitch there and stack to go. So so thank you, Jim. 
OK, thank, thank you, Wally. Um, any other contributions? I would just want to know what do they mean by time sensitive? If it... Sorry, uh, Sarah, could you help Jan there? Yeah, the time sensitive. Uh, yeah, it's just that the amount of time it can take sometimes to get match funding in place, because I think, you know, groups like these are used to doing the kind of, um, you know, raffles and and bingo evenings and things like that to raise money, which takes quite a amount of time to to organise. And um, so, yes, this would allow them to to go ahead with the first phase of the project, yeah. knowing that they still have significant um, fundraising to do for the second half. Um, so it was uh, simply to allow them to, to go ahead with this first phase. Um, but if members um, were uncomfortable at 100%, um, rather than defer, we could um, just have a discussion with the applicant to say that they should have um, match funding in place um, within three months of project approval, possibly. Um, that's just a suggestion there. OK, thank you, Sarah, for that. Raymond, do you want to come back? Yeah, I think that that's sensible putting a time uh, a time period on it. Um, so that's uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to go with that suggestion. Um, maybe Jan might be considerate of that as well, and that would allow I'm it, happy. Uh, the project. To go. Yeah, there we go. I'm happy to go with that <laughs> suggestion. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you very much, and thanks, Raymond and Willie. <laughs> okay, Sarah. So are we going for a deferment for time, or is it a support? Is a support we're going for? We're supporting yeah, support it with a, with, with, a, with a time with a time uh, with a time frame for them uh, to allow them to uh, come up with match funding. match funding. But there is no. But I did not uh, state uh, an amount of match funding. I, so long as they can demonstrate match funding uh, of some some value uh, within a period of three months, as Sarah said, then and that will reduce the amount by whatever amount um, that they can demonstrate that. Uh, then our uh, our award today will have been in good faith. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. OK, so we're happy to go with that with the, yeah, the time. Yeah. OK, Th thanks. Thanks, Sarah. OK, uh, the next one is the Pulteney Town People's Project. And um, this is for an employability coach and employability coordinator salary costs uh, to run a prepare for work club and job club and other initiatives to help support people back into work. Um, they've scored Amber on uh, three of the criteria there, but again, that's just because of um, not providing detailed answers to a couple of them. And it was just to highlight there that they now have uh, match funding in place. OK, thanks. Any? Newman? Uh, it's just a point of order. Sarah, do we all uh, have we missed out an application? Uh, have I? Oh yes, sorry, I've missed out on the uh, Pennyland School Parent Council. I'll go back to yeah. that. Um, okay, on 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 the, can, uh, on the PPP, yeah, on this one um, again, it's uh, followed the rag rating uh, system. Um, we, it doesn't flag up any particular concerns. I think that the project is uh, is well placed in terms of the criteria for the actual funding. I'd be supportive. Uh, I'd move to support this one and award the funding. Thank you. You thank you, Ruben. Anyone else got any comments? No, I'm happy to support the funding, Ron. Yeah, yeah Matthew. Yeah, thanks for the award three support. Um, yeah, that the area has always been boggy and wet and difficult. So, um, full support. I think it'll actually benefit probably arguably more people even than they, they anticipated. Thanks, Chair. OK, thank you, Matthew. Just yep, for, we'll your, just for your information, I've, sorry, I haven't been partaking because I've lost signal a couple of times. Uh, I'm hoping to stay with you. OK, that that would be good, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll move to su support this. Um, I don't think there's anybody else saying um, any other thoughts on that one. No, thank you. OK, Sarah, we'll go back okay, to the other um, one. We'll just go back to the Pennyland School Parent Council project. Um, so this is for the Pennyland Wellbeing Walk, um, so a well-being well -being path situated within the primary school grounds. Um, the path is to be approximately uh, 360 metres long by 1.2 metres wide. 
Um, the project costs include the construction of a path, interpretation panels, playground markings, seating, native tree and flower planting. Um, so for this project, the Highland Council would deliver it on behalf of the Parent Council. Um, so the details of arrangement and the arrangements of roles and responsibilities is to be confirmed by a partnership agreement. Um, so we would make that a grant condition if members were minded to approve this project. Um, planning permission is required um, and they have since submitted an application for that and the costs are based on recent quotes provided um, by Highland Council approved contractors. Um, and just to highlight the match funding is ranked amber as their awaiting decision outcome to applications to the Caithness Community Fund um, for seven and a half thousand and the Pennyland Parent uh, Council fundraising uh, totaling three thousand pounds. Okay, thank you, Sura. And um, Carl? Yeah, thanks, Ron. Um, I would be very supportive. I think it's interesting. There's also a, an inter intergenerational element in this project where, from memory, letters of support advise that, um, as I say, intergenerational activities will be encouraged. And, you know, it benefits a lot for, for everyone involved, they're obvious, uh, not least the community. So uh, I think we need to really congratulate the team that that's pulled this together. You highlighted just a, a level of cooperation, Sarah, so absolutely delighted to support it. Thanks, Carl. Um, Matthew? Yeah, thanks. Um, right, the comments I made one minute ago were meant to apply to this project. I just heard Sarah saying Penland School Path, so I thought that was the one she was talking about. So my comments of support when I was talking about the boggy area and the marshy bit, I don't know what which project Sarah had been talking about because I was offline. But uh, anyway, just to clarify that, but this project, uh, what Carl's just said, uh, is exactly right. Um, it's a really good project. And I again repeat my comment, I think it might actually benefit even more people than they anticipate. Thank you. OK, thank you. Yes, there's maybe problems in Bobby ground everywhere, Matthew. <laughs> yes, uh, Raymond. Yeah, I did wonder when Matthew said uh, the last one, thanks very much for the Ward 3 support of uh, of a Ward 2 uh, project, when I thought, no, unless the, somebody shifted the Pulteney Town People's Project 20 odd miles, um, then uh, yeah, I get what he was saying. Um, just uh, I would uh, encourage that, um, you know, if we are qualifying the match funding, that you know that that would have to be um, part of the subjective um, approach for this, uh, this project. We're, re we're requesting it of others. Um, I think that there needs to be a demonstration of that um, as this project goes on, but I don't think uh, we're in a position where we can refuse uh, the application based on that. I think that they have the ability to be able to demonstrate that going on, uh, going forward. So on that basis, I would be supporting it. Did I miss the actual, um, the overall community benefit? Did you address that, Sarah, in terms of the overall community benefit rather than a restricted benefit? It's not, uh, for me, it's not a preclu uh, precluding uh, factor in this, given what Carl has said there just now. Local members will have a far better idea than uh, maybe members on the dark side of the county over here. Thanks. OK, thanks, Raymond. Carl, you want to come back in or is that a historical hand there? Oh, no, sorry, Ron, it was historical. Oh, no, no problem. Uh, no problem. Um, Jan, you want to say something? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to support this. This um, So you can thank us now, Matthew, the, the Ward 3 members. Um, yeah, I'm happy to support this because I think it'll be very good for the whole community's well-being, um, especially with the tree plant and the flowers and the seats. It'll be a lovely area to walk walk and um, just be mindful of, you know. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to support it. Thank you. OK, Jan, thanks for that. And thanks for your support as well. Uh, OK, any more? Oh, no hands showing. Yeah, so I uh, move that we support this one. Yeah, and just to address um, Councillor Bremner's comments there that um, yes, it, it will be open to the wider community. It wouldn't just be restricted to the primary school use. And within their application, they've talked about um, linking up with Befrienders Highland and uh, 
local um, nursing homes um, and that they would want uh, the path to be um, of benefit to all. Thank you. Yes, thanks for that. Yeah, yeah, that's good points there. It's opening and up to it. The other point about the, the match funding, that it would be a conditional grant that they confirm match funding is in place before they start the project. Yeah, yeah, that would be on it, yes. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. OK. OK, uh, next up is Sinclair Bay Trust. Um, this project is to install three notice boards. Um, so it would be one at Keys Car Park, one at uh, Reese uh, Kilmister Play Park and Reese Beach Car Park um, to pass on essential information to residents and visitors. Um, so it's been ranked amber on uh, robustness. That's just because planning permission is required and um, the cost for this has been included within the project costs and also land owners permission um, is to be provided. Um, we don't foresee this to be a huge issue given that it's such a small project. Um, and the other thing to highlight is they have applied to the Caithness Beat Risk Community Fund for £3,000. Um, so they're expecting the, the outcome of that very shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Raymond? Yeah, I uh, I don't believe that there is going to, that there will be a, 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 an issue in terms of land ownership. I also don't see um, an issue in terms of planning permission. I think precedence has already been um, demonstrated in other areas like Milton, Haster, Thrumster, where these community notice boards exist and they are well used and they're very uh, they're very informative um, notice boards. I think it's a uh, high time that we had them in all the areas. So well done to the Sinclair's Bay uh, Community Trust for uh, taking this uh, forward and I support the application. I'll move to um, that we award. OK, thanks. Raymond. Any any more comments from anybody? I'm happy no. to approve this one. OK, then. Yeah, yeah, I think we'll move. Uh, we support this one. Hey Sarah, it's back to you again. Yep, uh, the next one is the Caithness Voluntary Group. Um, this is for um, an extension of their existing project to employ two development officers that will deliver the Caithness Cares, um, focusing on mental health and wellbeing within the community, and also to coordinate the Caithness Poverty Action Group um, to support those struggling with the cost of living crisis. Um, so this project scored well across the board, um, only getting an amber for the environmental sustainability, and that was just due to um, not providing a detailed answer uh, within the application. Um, so they have their um, match funding in place for this project as well. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Raymond? Yes, I know that the um, the chair of the Caithness uh, Poverty and uh, CPAG group is uh, a member, and uh, I'm not sure if he's declaring a, a, a connection. But uh, regardless, I think this uh, application is most definitely worthy of uh, being awarded. I think they've scored well on it. It uh, is one of the most qualifying of the criteria of um, the uh, laid out. So I'll be moving to support this uh, application. Thanks. OK, thank you, Raymond. Carl? Yep, happy to, to support Raymond's comments, uh, Ron. Thank you. OK, so thanks for that. Uh, Jan? I don't know whether I should explain that I'm a member of the poverty group, but um, so but so I won't say anything in this one. OK, thank you, Jan. Can I make a point of order there? Yes. Um, I think uh, Jan and we we're all by default um, um, members. We can all attend the CPI group, um, okay. but you're not a chair. So oh, I would have thought that it's just a, a, a connection that, uh, you know, as, as councillors, we all have the ability to be able to attend okay. CPI, but the application has actually come forward on uh, from the CBG. So okay. I don't okay. think that. Uh, I mean, not for me to advise you, but I. I That's I fine. Not no, that, no, no thanks, for, th thanks for that advice. Well, I'm really happy to support this as well because I think it's um, they're doing an amazing job. And the, the more help we can give uh, mental health support um, in this area is really, really needed. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to wholeheartedly support this group. Yeah, th th thanks, Jan. And uh, I'll just echo your comments here. It's really important. Yeah. 
OK, that nobody else. Um, so um, that will be supported. Okay, so okay. Next one is the Staxago and Papago community group, and this is for the Staxago Hall Zero Upgrades. Um, so the project itself is to improve the energy efficiency of Staxago Village Hall, um, reducing the carbon output and reducing energy costs. Um, so the project costs include the installation of external underfloor and roof insulation and air source heat pump and LED lighting. Um, they've scored well across the board, um, but the only thing there to mention to members is that they still have £20,000 match funding to be confirmed. Um, so this would be a condition of grant that that's confirmed before they start the project. Um, but they do have significant uh, match funding in place. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Carl? Yeah, I think we've got a plot which being the, the project and, and what they're trying to achieve here. So more than happy to support it with the conditions stated. Thank you. Thanks. Raymond? Um, sorry if I missed you mentioning about the planning permission, Sarah, but uh, that would also be a caveat. Uh, there would be two, one in terms of the match funding, the other in terms of the planning permission. Um, so but with the exception of that, um, I'd move to support it. OK, thank, thanks. Anybody else? No, um, we, we'll move that. We support that with, with the, the two conditions as mentioned. OK, um, just to confirm there, they do have planning permission, um, but they don't have a, a building warrant which would be required, and that would be a condition of grant. Thank you. Uh, I did mean building warrant. I got my planning applications and my building warrants muddled up there. I meant building warrant. That's no bother. Yep. OK, thanks, Sarah. OK, uh, next up is the Life Arts Centre, and this would be for their Caithness Artists in Residence project. Um, so this is to provide an art-based wellbeing activities uh, programme to reduce isolation and improve confidence in mental health and explore tools and ideas and advocate for a healthy um, wellbeing in Caithness. Um, so this again has scored well across the board and um, they have £15,000 match funding confirmed from Creative Scotland. However, they are ex uh, awaiting the outcome of a uh, £45,000 application to invest in a communities fund and um, they're expecting the outcome of that very shortly. So again, that would be a condition of grant that we get confirmation of match funding before the project can start. Ron, you're on mute there, but I'm presuming you're inviting. I'll go ahead without we'll any more Sorry, advice. Yeah, no, actually. Yeah, look, fantastic project and uh, wish them every success in what they're willing to do. And more than happy to support the uh, recommendations given. Thanks. Jan? I would, I'm happy to support this. Life Art Centre does an awful lot in the community um, for Keith Ness, and I have no difficulty in thinking that they will get the rest of the match support so um i'm happy to support this thank you okay thanks me Any too other? oh yes okay yeah no other comments okay well move that we support this one with the conditions as mentioned okay um next is the caithness mental health support group um for the extension of venue provision pilot um, so this project involves the recruitment of new staff member to act as a deputy to the service manager who oversees the two centres and um, they have one in WIC and one in Thurso um, and also to recruit a test of change staff member um, or consultant to look at the ways they can respond to community needs. Um, so the main aim of that is to take a more um, holistic approach um, to the mental health and wellbeing uh, needs in Caithness. Um, so they have secured match funding from the Community Led Local Development Fund. However, they still do have an application awaiting the outcome um, to the Lottery Fund, um, which is for £8,000. Um, and they expect to know that uh, the outcome of that next month. OK, thanks. That's another important one. Yes, Raymond? I'll be very brief. Uh, to wholly support this um, <laughs> application. Very much again um, in, um, in keeping with the criteria that has been set. Um, so um, I'll move that we support this. 
uh, with the conditions as uh, stated by Sarah. OK, thanks, Raymond. Anyone else? Got... No, no hands no, up there. I'm happy to support that. OK, then uh, when we, we support that with the conditions again. OK, Sarah. Uh, next up is Ray Hall. So this is for the refurbishment phase two um, to improve accessibility. Um, so stage two involves the formation of new accessible entrance and the reconfiguration of toilets, including all abilities access, improved access to the main hall, boy and improved lighting and decorative repairs. Um, so they do have match funding confirmed from the Caithness and North Sutherland Fund um, of £30,000 and they also have £25,000 confirmed from the Bailey Wind Farm Community Benefit Fund and they've also set to commit um, £22,603 of their own funds. Um, but they are still awaiting the outcome of an application to the Scottish Landfill Communities Fund for £25,000 um, and they're expecting all the outcome of that um, during February. Um, so yes, there is an element of match funding still waiting to be confirmed, um, so we'd make that a, a grant condition. Um, however, they do have significant match funding already in place. OK, thanks, Sarah. Raymond? Yeah, um, with, uh, I'll support, I'm happy to support this. I know it's not uh, it's in, uh, in our other board, but this is a case must wide um, fund. <laughs> I'm um, happy to um, support it, happy to support it by the conditions um, and I'll move to uh, and I'll move to award. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Carl? Yeah, likewise, more than happy to support what Raymond said. Can I just ask you a question, Sarah, on the, you said it was Scottish Landfill Communities Fund, because we, I, I remember when they passed, so is that, is that CETA and is that where that comes from? Uh, I'm not actually sure on that one. No, it doesn't. That's OK. No, it's I just... think it is a, a Scottish wide um, competitive basis, though, yeah. rather than having um, local allocations. Oh, OK. I was always conscious. I remember us having a rep from pointing us towards CETA, you know, that they were that it was specific. So, no, thanks. OK. OK, Sarah. Um, Jan? Oh, I'm happy to support this with the condition as Sarah said. This is a very, very busy hall and it's very, very well used and it should be put up to the standard that it's acceptable now in this day and age. So very happy to support it. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Yeah. Anybody else got any comments? Not seeing anything coming up. Nope. Yeah, we'll move to support support this one with, with the conditions again, Sarah. Good luck. And next is the WEC Development Trust. This is for the WEC campsite upgrades phase one. Um, so it's to create, create new on-site roads to increase designated pitches at the campsite. Um, so this is expected to, uh, to increase by 75 uh, places, including 12 new hard standing pitches. Um, and this would be specifically to reduce water logging. Um, and they also want to double the electric hookup capacity from 30 to 66 and replace internal lighting and fencing. Um, so this project against the assessment criteria has scored uh, greens um, on the RAG. And uh, just to highlight that the match funding uh, contribution would be from their, their own sources. OK, thanks very much. Yeah, uh, good scoring on that one. Um, Jan? You're up first there. Oh, sorry, is it Raymond? I think Raymond beat me. Raymond, but... Raymond yes, sorry. The, the machine is just changed. <laughs> As usual. As usual. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not bothered. <laughs> oh, um, you are... <laughs> I have a funny feeling that Jan and I are going to say the same thing in this. Part. Yeah, um, probably. It's the. Uh, I would say that this is a, an, a, an exemplary um, application, and if others who are looking to qualify the criteria of uh, this kind of scheme and this kind of funding scheme, they really should get in touch with whoever is actually uh, putting together the applications on behalf of some of these um, uh, groups, because this um, can be held up to be one of those um, exemplary applications. The, um, the campsite, um, and we're well aware of the uh, Work Development Trust and what they've been trying to do with this as an asset for the community and as an asset to eventually make money for the community and the common good. 
So um, I would uh, wholly support this um, application. Thanks. Okay, thank you, everyone. Jan? Yeah, I would wholly support this application as well. Um, this is a city, it is an exemplary application, and this is a win win situation for um, this side of the community. I'll bring tourists and everything in, and um, yeah, and hopefully, you know, uh, contribute to the, co the White Common Good Fund as well. Um, so, yeah, absolutely 100% happy to support this project. Okay, thank you, Jan. Andrew? Uh, thank you, Chair. I mean, as ever, delighted to see anything of you know significant development uh, in, in in the county. So, so wholeheartedly support this. And um, just a, a quick question to Sarah, though. And um, obviously, due to the sort of nature of this project, in each of the budget lines, the uh, detailed uh, contingency, you know, costs and allowances. Um, just in the event that, I mean, for whatever reason, the, the costs come in on budget. Uh, you know, do they keep any of the, the money over or is that you know recouped um and then can be given out in, in future years by us? Uh yes, any project um that encounters underspend, um that money is just returned to the Caithness area budget for reallocation. Um so that would just go into the the pot for the for the next uh, tranche of funding. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, Raymond? Just a correction to what we're saying. I said that about going into the WIC common good, and I know that Jan was say, saying similar. It wouldn't be, it's uh, the WIC Development Trust uses it to invest in projects within the town centre of WIC that, uh, and the development of um, WIC and, and its town centre, not necessarily the common good fund. Um, both are both are um, going to be there for the for the betterment of the town centre of the Wexel. I just wanted that correction there. It's not actually the Wex common good. Yeah, but it's for the benefit of uh, WIC. Thanks, Raymond. Yeah, we can't argue with that. It will benefit, yes. OK, then, no more comments, and uh, we'll go and um, move it to do, to support that application. Thanks, Sarah. OK, and moving on to the Final application. This is the Thurso Youth Club um, refurbish refurbishment phase two. Um, so this is to refurbish toilets uh, within the Thurso Youth Club to modernise and make fit for purpose, and also to replace guttering and downpipes to prevent water ingress to the to the building. Um, so they have secured um, match funding through the CLLZ fund. Um, and they are putting forward a request for £10,000 um, from the Caithness Area Committee. Okay, um, thank you. So this one has scored greens across the board, so there is no com uh, concerns there. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Matthew, I think, is it? No, sorry, it's Carl. Carl. Hey, look, another, another good application from a, a range of fantastic applications. So. Um, doing some really good work going on here, and it's, it's you know it's phase two, so really delighted to support it. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Matthew. Yeah, likewise. And I was kind of thinking, just listening to Sarah there, you know, when organisations are needing money for simple things like replacing guttering and road pipes, you know, this is where this money is really making, you know, a practical difference. And just majoring in on things like gutters, you know, if you don't have the money to replace them, you end up with a building that gets damp in it and then you need to spend far more money. So it's arguably it's a small example, but it's just the sort of thing that is a real pleasure to be able to say yes to giving money for projects like this. Thank you, Matthew. Anyone else got any comments? No. No, yes, yes, I, I know a bit about the youth club and the, the amazing work they do do, and they, also they, they they cook the meals there for the elderly people. So the, yeah, good work there. So I'll move to support this application. Yep. Thank you, Sarah. Got your own mute, Sarah. Sorry, um, that brings us to the end of the list there. Um, so if you just give me a second, I'll just total up um, the final figures of commitment there. That would be good, thanks. Okay, 
OK, so on the basis of um, rejecting the applications of Thurso Community Cafe and the Ray Golf Club, um, that would be a commitment of um, £417,912.11. And, um, and given the, the total funding available is the £552,010.52, um, that would leave... 134,098 quid. Yes, uh, and 41 pence um, to be considered for the the Wick Chapel Road um, top up request. Okay, thanks very much. I think we can manage a 48 pence for Raymond there. <laughs> I am joking. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I'm just looking for agreement to put the remaining balance over to the Wick project. Has anybody got any Raymond? Yeah, I'll move. Uh, I'll move the, that that's the case. Um, the community have been uh, looking for this for some time, um, and um, that this is exactly what that kind of uh, this is exactly the fund that is uh, there for supporting um, the community's aspirations, especially in developing the town centre of Wick. Thanks. Thank you, um, Jan. I'm happy to second that for all the reasons given. But but Raymond, we definitely need public toilets in, in Wick for the tourists and everyone else, the tourists and our local communities. Thank you. Absolutely, yeah. And that's something us from the other side can use when we're through visiting as well. So, yeah. yeah um, no more, more comments on that. Oh, well, Willie, sorry. Yes, Chair. Agreed. Yep. Thanks. Right. OK, thanks. There's no more comments there. So we move to uh, agree that the balance goes over to the project. Thank you, Sarah, for okay. your input there. It was very good. Thanks. I appreciate there was a lot to go through there, there today. There was a few. Thanks, thanks for all the comments and um, I'll make sure that the feedback is given to the applicants and particularly where members have given praise to organisations as well. I think that's always important for them to hear. So I'll make sure that that's passed along. Yes, thanks very much for your work, I th Sarah. I think we've actually did very well. There's only actually two we've rejected. Is that correct, Sarah? Uh, yes, yeah. So yeah. I'll be able to uh, get back to um, everyone about the, the outcome of today's meeting um, later on this afternoon. OK, thank you very much. And thank your little puppy for his input. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, no don't, mine's thank always you. doing it. <laughs> right now, folks, I, th I think we'll have um, a 10 minute break if you're in agreement with that before we move on to item eight. Um, we get 15 minutes, please, Rowan. OK, then. Well, yeah, we'll have a 15 minute break. We'll Thank listen you. at quarter to one. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Thank you. OK, we'll get the glasses out now. Item eight, Area Roads Capital Programme 23-24. I'm delighted to see we have Josie here to go through it with us. Over to you, Josie. Hi, afternoon. Yeah, I know. <laughs> everybody. Um, yeah, as um, members will see, the, Keith, the Roads Capital Programme has been put forward for your consideration. Um, as usual, it, it, it sort of, as previously I've done, I've listed all the roads that we're aware of that are needing work on in Appendix 2, and they've been a prioritised um, according to our engineering judgment across the county. There is a red line on it this year, which um, refers to an anticipated budget allowance. Currently at the moment, no budget has been set, um, as I say, in Item 5 of the report. Um, I, what I've based it on is the baseline capital budget. So at the moment, we don't have our budget set. So historically, we, we had a baseline capital budget and that was that's what's sort of almost 600,000. The last previous two years, um, there was additional monies, which gave us about 1.2 million. So you can see the difference when we have a baseline. Appendix one is last year's budget awards that we finally got um after um, was it march april time 
So it was just to give the members an idea. At the moment, there is nothing confirmed about any extra money. So I have based um, the spend on last year's baseline preview. Even, and at the moment, that is still very much an indi indication because it could be more, it could be less at the end of the day. Depends on what members agree at full committee and then what comes down to the roads. So um, that's what it is at the moment. However, Appendix 2 is our identified list of works in a priority. And I've also shown last year's priority. So you'll see that some have jumped up, some have moved down, some don't have a priority for last year. So they're new entrants on the on the list, if you will. Um, and where some have moved down or moved up, it'll depend. You might find that they were previously down for surface dressing, but now they've gone beyond that and they need to be overlaid or inlaid. So even the 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 activity, you know, the, the treatment we're going to give them has changed. Um, and again, an estimated cost to lay is against each one. That has been amended to reflect the prices increase that we've experienced over the last year. I say nothing's escaped the cost of living. So there is a little bit sort of less less tar for your money on the ground. However, that's the report. That's our list of roads identified. Over to you. Sorry, I was brief. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to mic off for a second. Um, yeah, uh, thanks very much, Josie, for that. Um, I'll open it up now for members for any questions or discussion. Raymond? You'd be very surprised if I wasn't uh, uh, quick up on my hand, Josie. OK, first of all, thanks uh, for all the work. Um, and, you know, uh, officers are are paid to do the work that we that, that, that they do. We know that. But it's nice to uh, show an appreciation um, every now and then. And now's the time to once again uh, accord our thanks and our appreciation for the work that the, the boys do. Um, and very much so because I took a picture of a pothole um, at the end of my street um, here in Thrumster. Uh, yesterday, um, I was going to send it in to let folks know that it was there, but I can assure you everybody and their dog would know that that pothole is, is there, just to let folks know that it was there and to have it attended, as with uh, many other potholes in Caithness, at some point uh, when um, the roads engineers can have it attended to. And lo and behold, before I could even send the uh, photograph in, the hot box was here this morning with a team of lads with the road roller, and they've done all the potholes, the main, uh, the main potholes in Thromster with a hot patch, uh, but it will not be planed out. They will be trying to get round all the potholes as best as they can um, with the hot box and with the road roller um, while this uh, period of reasonable weather is prevailing. It's in the winter time. I think it's important that we we note that. So um, pass on our appreciation to them. Um, we've noted online, you know, some of the the comments, the the passive and rather direct comments. But we know that when they do manage to get round to it, they do they, they really try and do as best a job as they possibly can. Um, and noting that if we don't, if we tried to play now every single pothole at this time of the year, given winter. The, uh, we would probably not get the uh, desired effect um, and we certainly would only get about half the potholes uh, that we need to get done um, done. So that's my comment on that. In terms of the, I, I think uh, what I'd like you to give us uh, some clarification on, uh, and I hope you don't mind me taking a bit of time on this one. Uh, each area is reporting differently at this point in time. Um, if you look at Badenoch and Strathspey, they've just agreed this morning and um, they've got quite a, an extensive list for an area that really doesn't have um, the amount of um, road concerns that we have um, because of the amount of trunk roads that they have that are looked after by Transport Scotland and uh, a contractor. But uh, again, there's is quite extensive because they've identified these lists in a programme of um, 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 planned maintenance. They're not all going to be done. They they don't all need done uh, in a one um, and that's why we've asked you over uh, a number of years to be able to populate the list so that we can see as far in advance as we possibly can in terms of the planned maintenance. 
That's why there is 178 on the current list. You could have actually uh, reported 100 or 50. That's been done in years previous. But here in Caithness, we actually have the 178 listed. That's the plan. That is a planned maintenance. It does not mean, uh, and perhaps you can clarify, that every single road that is on that list at this point in time needs a, it needs attended to. It is therefore planned maintenance. I give you an example. Item number 36, 30, I can't remember at the moment, but item number 36 is my own street, um, Bakey Place in Thromster. It's uh, first on the list for uh, surface dressing, but I'm sure officers would take a view as to whether that would actually become uh, uh, surface dressed if members and officers were minded to have a surface dressing programme this year. Certainly, the folks in Bakey Place would be hugely surprised if their uh, if their street was surface dressed this year because they would not expect it to be. They don't think that there's a, an issue with it, but yet it's number 36 in the programme. I, sub I suspect that's because at the time that it was adopted by the council, which was about 20 years ago, it would immediately come onto the uh, the planned maintenance because of a, the lifetime, the expected lifetime of a road. So perhaps you can give us clarification on that and clarification on exactly what the status is of the 178 um, uh, listed items. I would also go to, I think it's number 178, and it's always been at the end of the list, and that is the cemetery road. Now, the cemetery road has gone from, oh, crikey, wherever, whatever, however many you put on a list towards us, it's always at the end. And here it is at number 178. Uh, so it's no surprise to us. But the cemetery road has been starting to deteriorate over a number of years. So it is not the case that all 178 roads right now require to be um, looked at. It is a planned maintenance list, not, as I've read recently in the papers, a defective roads list. OK. Nor is the £4.6 million, pounds, as I understand it, that that list will come to, is reflective of potholes in Caithness. So perhaps you could let us know, um, just for the record, how potholes are actually attended to. Uh, generally, as I understand it, they're attended to from the revenue, not from the capital list. But potholes can be attended to uh, in the capital list because if they are part of a surface dressing programme, um, because we're going to surface dress a certain amount of road, within that, period, uh, within that length of road, we will actually look at the, uh, what potholes are there and we'll attend to them before we actually uh, surface stress the road. And similarly, if there are potholes that are in a, a particularly bad area of um, road that's needing resurfaced, they will automatically get attended to because of the resurfacing. Those potholes will be covered by the capital project, but by and large, pothole attendance is covered from the revenue budget. Whereas the 4.6 million that is referred to, that I've seen in the press, is capital spend and therefore is not relative necessarily relative to potholes in general uh, across the county. So I'm just wanting us to get some of the uh, stuff that you're reporting here in absolute context. Because and, and here in Caithness, if you look at Caithness with its 4.6 million pound capital listing and Sky, which is reporting something like, oh, I can't think, I can't remember, it's actually been reported, but um, their list is not necessarily reflective of all the roads that they need to attend to in Sky. And um, there are other areas where there are lists, and some of them have only got 10 roads on them, like uh, Dingwall. It's just had, uh, it's just reported that that they're going to fix. So it, it, the, it is not necessarily the case that what you've reported is reflective of the entire uh, state of the roads in Caithness. You, you could you could have your uh, engineers go out there and you could extend that list to 250. You could extend it to 400, and I bet you could if if you were so minded. So it's just making sure that we get this list in context. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. I might come back in later, um, depending on um, how the debate goes. But can you really uh, give us some absolute definition uh, of how that list should be read? And one question, there is no surface dressing programme highlighted so far um, for this year. All the money seems to be going on inlay and overlay. And if that can be uh, confirmed, thanks. Thanks, Raymond. <coughs> do you want, Josie, do you want to come in? I think so. Um, I'm just trying to process everything you've asked me and try and deliver it in a, a, a reasonable manner. So, OK. Um, within roads, we get two pots of money. We get a capital pot of money, which is what identifying what we're talking about here. 
There is a revenue pot which on Appendix 1 is, um, if I'm right, is highlighted in there what their revenue budget is. That is, is for routine cyclical maintenance, our day-to-day -day business, if you like. And it does include um, pothole repairs. It includes drainage, signage, um, all the day-to-day -day stuff that we do that our guys are routinely employed to do. So and in theory, if we had no capital money, they would still be able to go out and do some repairs, although it would be limited. It'd be running maintenance, if you like, you know. Um, so this budget here, which is what is up for your consideration, is, is a, the capital pot of money that we have to spend on um, improving the road network. Um, there's been arguments in the past about spending it on car parks or spending it on something else. No, this is for the road network um, and maintaining the network that we have. Um, and so the aim is to identify good big chunks of sections um, of, of roads, um, if you like. I mean, to use analogy, the revenue is for maintaining paint in your windows. This is for repairing them replacing them, doing that kind of, of bigger structural repairs to the road in that context. So you don't want to have a small amount of potholes that this money gets spent on. You want to look at the bigger picture, you know, where is there a stretch of road that would benefit from a repair? So an overlay is where we just literally put tar on over the top of the existing. We maybe run two layers, one to regulate out the potholes, the unevenness, and then a running course, a wading course. An inlay is where you've got something like curbs. And if you keep building up the layers, you'd end up with a road higher than the curbs. So you have to plane out the curb, you know, bring it down to put it back, if you like. Same principle, even out the layers and then put on the wading course. Surface dressing is where the road is looking, to all intents and purposes, tired. The bitumen's lost its ability to be flexible and it's gone a bit brittle. And to, you know, um, to most people, you say that road's still OK, but when the engineers go out, we're looking at where it's starting to be a little bit um, lean with bitumen. It's starting to crack. It's maybe just to, to, to sort of not just have that resilience, that flexibility that it should have. So we will identify a road that needs surface dressing and it just needs a seal on it to protect it that a little bit more. And that's where I think um, people aren't tend nearly as much to see chipping done you know because they don't see it's good value for money in fact it's the opposite you get you can extend the life of a road for a relatively small amount of money and in some cases there are um, preparatory works required i.e some of the potholes need repaired you know it might be there's edge deterioration there's edge rutting so you need to amend the levels particularly on single track roads so that's where you do some prep works and then you go up, go along after. Surface dressing is also a very time sensitive operation. It's usually two or three months in the year that we can deliver it. You can't do it when the humidity is too high as well. So there's rainy days if the, the ground's not dry enough. So th there's a lot of considerations with surface dressing and we can only do it at certain times, which is, you know, can't do it out with the tourist season. We have to do it at the height of the tourist season, that kind of thing. So that's the two pots of money that's the identification of this list and I have to say the technical team um, in Caithness and Sutherland because they cover both they generally try and get out and drive every every road and these are roads that we're aware of our our own roadmen have highlighted gets reported by members it gets reported by members of the public I mean and it is we do go out and we do try and cover as much of them as possible and to get a view ourselves and then identify sections that need to be done and whether they are a patching section would work, whether it is a huge overlay, whether it is surface dressing, what treatment is required. And as we go out that we build a picture of how Caithness is looking. And, you know, there are the less travelled roads that we go on. We still have a duty to look after them. And so we'll we'll maybe pick up and say, right, that one. You know, it's holding up this year. It might not hold up next year. It might not survive another winter. Depends on the type of winter we go. So we'll put it on our radar. We'll put it on the list and say, well, you know, maybe in a couple of years, that section there is going to deteriorate. And we've highlighted it. We put it on the list. 
But what we're doing is giving you a snapshot is what that list is of. And I compiled that list about two weeks ago. So that list was a snapshot of the roads that we had looked up up until that point and we'd prioritised them at that point. However, we are still in winter. We've had a, a bout of snow and frost. And so there might be roads that aren't on the list that we thought they're holding up. But with the, the freeze thaw that we've just had recently and then heavy rain, it might be that that road has deteriorated and all of a sudden there could be a road that will come on our radar that we thought was going to be OK. It might be the one that's already on there and it's gone up the road. Caithness, the sorry, the cemetery road, it's on our radar and it's one, you know, you'd like to do it. But in the meantime, other roads come along that are all of a sudden of a higher priority, you know, and, and so they'll take over and that road might keep getting bumped down and maybe until a point where it actually has to be done. And that's the juggling to be done with the, the amount of money we have. Where do you spend it to try and keep as many roads as possible across the county? going and you do consider the use of that road where it links what it links and that type of thing how many people are running on it what's its purpose that all ties in with our roads hierarchy um, and if you look on the Badenoch report as um, Councillor Bremner referred to it mentions the hierarchy it gives you that element um, so that's this list that's where it's come from as I say the estimated cost is this is an indication at this time as a, and because it was a snapshot we may go out and find a section of road we've identified say the first one is 300 meters we might actually when we get round to doing it say oh it's going to be 400 it might be 450 however the next section down we've got 1.2 kilometers and we might say well actually a kilometer will do it so it, when we finally get there and we make that real assessment on the site, that the, the lengths can change, they can extend, they can shorten. We had one road, I think was it last year, it almost doubled in length because there was a development that had happened that we were unaware of. And all of a sudden, what we'd identified in the January, it, it was like, no, that, that we need to do twice that amount whilst we're here to save this road. So it, it's it's a fluid kind of operation and we are always trying to keep it and deliver the best but at some point I have to give you a snapshot and I'm trying to identify just how many are on our radar for this so that's the capital side of it revenue potholes are um so we have a roads inspector that goes out and inspects the roads in accordance with a hierarchy so some get done monthly some quarterly and some are once a year but they pick up our road safety defects um, and along with the road, these defects and public reporting, along with yourselves reporting, we then do what we call it's the routine maintenance. So in some cases, it's a reactionary um, piece of work where we're going out, say, oh, load of potholes there, we need to go and do that road. Others, it's like, right, we know there's a couple of potholes, we'll get them temporary and then we need to really do a hot patch when we've got the, the right conditions, temperature. And that has happened in Wick Town. We were aware of, of a series of potholes. We'd identified we'd rather like to do hot tar patching. However, the weather changed in December and then it came again in January. So the minute the guys have had that opportunity, they've been out and they're doing these potholes um, as we can. That's the revenue pot of money. And for me, it's juggling. Do I do I put them on signs? Do I put them on potholes? Do I put them on ditching? Do I put them on potholes? You know, and I know everybody would love to see every single pothole and all our money spent on potholes. But I refer back to the previous item where if we don't do our drainage and our ditching, it's a bit like having no downpipes and no gutters. You know, you're 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 leaving the fabric of the road. Drainage is one of the most important things about the road. And if you don't deal with your drainage, it you can lose, it can get washed away, the freeze and that. So there's a balance there on the revenue side as well. But that um that's not what the youth members get to see that list because it's a constant changing list and it's how we react and that's that judgment call that's made by the operational staff on the day. Um, and that is, you know, that can change from last week to this morning. I hope, Councillor Bremner, that has covered everything and is, is 
clear enough to understand where that list has come from um, on that. Thank you, Josie. That, that was a really good explanation of uh, the problems you face, shall we say. <laughs> um, we've got Andrew, if you want to come in. Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, I mean, Josie, I don't think any of us here envy the, the job you had. And it you know, fundamentally comes down to, you know, what you said, pox. Um, and, and the real big issue you know, d doesn't, you know, lay with you know, yourself or how you prioritise. It's always going to be a balancing act. And, you know, the, the best that can be done here today, unfortunately, is uh, if, if some of us decide that, no, we think one particular role is more important than another on, on, on the list. Um, and we shouldn't be in th this, this situation because it's clear that you know, we can talk about the, the, the pots as much as we want. They're just not big enough. Um, and I mean, we all know that things need to change radically, hugely in, in the, the council um, to you know, fund the repairs that are needed, along with you know, some you know, real focused lobbying activity on both governments. But you know, so far, I mean, I've seen year after year where it's just this, you know, as far as I see in, in the chamber from the politicians in the administration, just this very vague talk of, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do this or we'll review that. And, and I mean, I'm coming into year six in, in this job now and I've not seen anything fundamentally change. And, you know, Raymond, when, when, when you just spoke, you know, this paper we have in front of us here is, is a disaster. I mean, it, it, it says that no matter what option we, we decide, that the, the roads are only going to get worse. We we know that, and you know, you know, and th this isn't a you know a political a jibe, but I mean, as council leader Raymond, I would really like to see you know you stand up, you know, take ownership, and say how this administration and you as council leader are going to. Are going to do everything to find the savings in in the council to increase the budget for roads. And I mean, I looked back through the the budget amendments I brought through in, in the last term. In each of the in each of the last five years, just me on my own, what I found in in savings above and beyond what was already a balanced budget, uh, totaled thirty eight million pounds in road spending increase over a five year period. Um, but you know, I, I honestly, I, I wonder why I even bothered when the, the the administration just voted them down each and every single time. And I was criticised for you know, say by 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 many saying that uh, this wasn't going to fix everything. Well, of course it wasn't. But if me and one person on my own, if I can find you know over a series of years lots of little savings and efficiencies and changing ways of working in the council to you know add thirty eight million to the roads budget, you know. With all the the resources and staff um, that that are in you know, the council, with some you know proper political leadership, surely to God we can find a way to find even more. Um, and I, I know Raymond's itching to you know come back, and that's 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 only fair. But I mean, Raymond, I, I don't want to hear middle management speak or buzzwords or review or you know get it in context or balance or or, or any of these words. You know, I, 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 I want to know, and I think everyone wants to know, what is your vision? You know, because I'm not seeing or hearing any passion that you really believe in the power and influence that your uh, position as council order, leader here. gives you. Um, and th this hold, hold on a second, Andrew. Andrew, hold on a sec. This is, a and, this is a case in this area committee, not a meeting of the full council. Sorry, I, I didn't catch what you said there. I said this is the Caithness Area Committee. It is not a meeting of the full council. Thank you. OK, thank you, Raymond. <coughs> right, Andrew, <coughs> just keep to the Caithness side of things if you can. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. well, it, it's, it's quintessentially important. I mean, I, I imagine uh, Councillor Bremner is not taking a pay cut for being here today. He's still leader of, of, of the council. And uh, as much as we may be on different political sides, uh, you know, I, I genuinely thought that having uh, a leader of the council from Caithness would have you know, brought some real transformative change. Yet yeah, we may be in different political parties, but you know what, when it, when it comes to Caithness, Caithness is Caithness. But I, I've just not seen a, a fracture of what I, I, I really hoped that, that, that could have been. So really, if we're going to make 
I mean, any meaningful difference to the roads, it is going to require st significant redesign, not just of the service, not just of how contracts are managed, but how this council fundamentally spends its money and what is the priority. Because if we say the priority is roads, and I think many of us agree the roads are, are our top priority, how is that reflecting in any of the actions that this council takes in the chamber's politicians? This is not a criticism of the staff. They have to work on the budgets that are that are agreed by councillors. This is a problem for councillors and the politicians to fix. And I, I'm just not seeing any leadership on it, and I never have. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Willie, your hand's up next. Willie, are you there? No, I think have we lost Willie? No, Ma Matthew, you've got your hand up. Yeah, um, thank you, Ron. Thank you, Josie, and thanks to the guys for their work. <clears throat> they do their best in pretty much impossible circumstances. Um, I agree with Councillor Jarvie about using the word disaster as far as the roads are concerned. It's not a criticism of the staff whatsoever, but I think it's so serious that I've asked the new chief executive if she'd come and visit to see for herself because she's 110 miles away and it's very, very difficult for her to actually visualise what's going on in North Sky or Caithness um, without coming to see for herself. My conclusion is, and this is close to my heart, I mean, um, this is why I resigned over a year ago because of the figures that were projected to be spent on roads or the lack of figures. The, own, the council cannot do this financially. It's impossible. Therefore, my conclusion is the council must ask the Scottish government for emergency funding. I see no other alternative. And Josie, I do have two or three questions to hopefully you can answer. The first one is a sort of strategic one. If you look at the report and paragraph, I've written this out to make sure I get it word for word, paragraph 3.2, the report states, and this is a report that is kind of replicated as far as I understand it around all the council areas, you know, they're almost identical, but the report states that this programme of works enables the council to meet its duty under the Road Scotland Act 1984. If you expand that, we're actually talking about section one, which is the council's duty to maintain the roads, to maintain the roads. And then if you move down to section 3.5, and I'll read it out word for word. Um, sorry, you may be still looking for this, but what it says word for word is, and I applaud you for your absolute honesty and lack of buzzwords, the level of investment falls short of the budget requirements to maintain a steady state condition of the road network deterioration of the overall network will occur with a corresponding risk to the traveling public and i think and i'm hoping this will be recorded formally i have a really serious grave concern that the public the council i should say is not actually maintaining the roads and therefore not carrying out its legal duty um i wanted to ask josie i know partially the answers here but the situation regarding vacancies and the reason I ask is that last summer I met with the then chief executive and Malcolm McLeod and expressed my concerns that your department was really overworked, understaffed, under equipped with plant um, and I was told that something would be done about it, it would be looked at but my understanding is that both in Caithness and Sutherland even more so there are vacancies and they have been stalled and not filled. Um, I also would like to ask about the use of the pothole pro machine because my understanding is that the hot tar lorry that it relies on to actually fill the potholes has only just come back on the road because it's been off the road for a long time waiting for parts. And I'm not a believer, Chair, I've nearly finished, you could bear with me, but this is arguably the most important topic on our agenda today as far as the public are concerned. I just want to chuck a few figures in for people to think about. Uh, Raymond referred to Sky, and I think he was correct. Their spend is about the same as ours, five or six hundred thousand a year, but their backlog is 2.6 million. Our backlog in our report is 4.6 million. I've always suspected Norfolk Sky has been um, a particular problem area, but it's not as bad as Caithness. 
And a few weeks ago, the council published a paper with a number of reported defects or complaints. Caithness had 4,754, Nairn had 137, and Inverness had 2,043. That's the council's own figures. And I think that is some evidence that the way the budget is distributed actually within Highland Council may not be correct, but the much bigger picture is the way the money comes um, from Edinburgh. And the other point I want to make, and I apologise folks for giving figures, but last year on this list we had I think 114 projects. This year it's about 180. I think the actual number of projects, because I've been around Thurso, there are lots of streets in Thurso that need repaired, they're not even on this list. I think the true length of the list could be 400, which I think is what Raymond might have mentioned a couple of minutes ago. And I think the real cost might be 15 or 20 million. The problem is we don't actually know, but it's much, much worse than this list indicates. And the main reason for my concern, Josie, which I wanted to ask you about, is I've looked really closely at the list, Appendix 2, and of the first 13 projects, which are the ones we can probably afford to do this year, I note that 17, uh, sorry, seven of those 13 weren't on the list at all last year. So what that's actually saying to me is, and I stand to be corrected because you're the roads expert, that means that nearly half of the projects that we can afford to repair this year, they weren't even, they hadn't even been highlighted last year. They weren't on that list last year. So that very strongly indicates that the roads are disintegrating before our eyes and new projects and problems are cropping up as fast as we can record them. And that, that to me, I think indicates, we're, in very plain English, we're, no, we're nowhere near keeping up with the roads. They're disintegrating much faster than we're able to fix them. And I think these figures um, bear that out. And I do think that's why I just think we need to get a grip right now and we need emergency funding because otherwise, and I'd like to ask your professional advice on this, Josie, you know, what is the direction of travel for our roads? Because yes, we've had some snow and frost, but that's just that's just a typical Highland winter and we could have a lot more yet if we're unlucky. But those are the, the questions, the uh, pothole pro, the vacancies and the council's legal position. Um, and I finished by re-emphasizing what I said at the beginning, that I'm sure we all fully support all the staff in the work they're trying to do. Um, it's just so difficult, but I would really appreciate uh, short answers as best you can um, to those points. Thank you very much, Chair, for bearing with me. OK, Matthew. Um, Josie, do you want to address that? Yeah. Um, first of all, the legislation, the Road Scotland Act does say that the council, uh, the local roads authority shall maintain, but also says they shall manage and maintain. How we manage our road network is set out in um, policy codes of practice. And as you know, policy comes to members. Um, so the, th that may be how they manage what they can't maintain is what was set out there. So I'll leave that one there. Um, in terms of um, additional resources, I believe last year revenue um, across roads got an input of two million pounds. Um, and our head of service at that time um, commuted that into various ways it would be spent, one of which is to um, set up a in-house white lining squad for centre lines. Um, the kit's been ordered, I believe recruitment is still yet to happen because of the lead in um, for the plant. In Caithness, that equated to um, two assistant foreman posts. In Sutherland, it was slightly different, but it was it was equaled out on the same basis that the roads revenue budget was dished out. So that's how and those posts came with a, um, a backup of um, the plant that would be required and materials for each individual. So we have had an, in, an increase, if you like, in investment in roads in the last year. We've, I mean, we've received that every area got their pothole pro. What I would like to remind members is I got one per operational area and my operational area is Caithness and Sutherland. So it's not exclusively Caithnesses, um, which, and at, but at the moment it has been, it's not been into Sutherland. Um, yes, I'll touch on the hot box. It, it wasn't so much waiting for parts as waiting for an MOT. 
which is now hard and as um it was reported it's been out and about and the weather has helped and if the weather is bad that hot box it comes off the back of the lorry and we put a gritter on it that's you know the the, the fundamental side of that vacancies um we did recruitment last year and we did manage to recruit some staff but um some have left some turned around after a, a little while and said this job's not for me you know, it's not just about sitting driving a gritter in the bad weather. You have to get out and fill in the potholes, as you say. So there's been some successes and some not successes, but we've also, you know, we've experienced resignations. So it's an ongoing process, the recruitment and re recruiting um, skilled, you know, the people with the skills to deliver the road maintenance side of it is, is always a challenge at the moment. Um, we're currently sitting with two vacancies in Thurso and one in Wick and one in the office. Um, so that's technical team. So across, across Caithness, there's four. Um, Pothole Pro. I'll touch on the reports in each area. Each roads operations manager compiles their list of works to be done differently. Um, as you commented, Rosher, they just give you the list of works they're going to do. They do not give you an overall picture of the full scale of works. Um, I can't comment on Sky, but um, I dare say you might get an answer similar to mine, whereby it's not an exhaustive list and it's what they've managed to get round and identify as the worst on their list. Um, I know from speaking to colleagues it is if their technical support isn't quite as good, they do find it a difficult challenge to bring a comprehensive list and none of us will give you 100% list of what the roads, how bad every single road is. And I'll touch on um, the road condition survey that gets done. It gets done annually, but it'll do the A roads every year, but only in one direction. So they only get done every second year. Um, the other roads will get done, is it every few years? And the U class roads, the most rural ones, sometimes it's every 10 years they are surveyed. So Sometimes the condition of roads as surveyed isn't quite what's on the ground. So this is why we send the guys out. We send our technical team out to actually physically look at them and not just rely on data. Um, the what else was there you wanted? I've forgotten. I've got I've got notes, but they're not making sense anymore. <laughs> I think the main one, Josie. If I had to pick one out, and thanks for your answer, um, was the observation that seven of the 13 projects that you hope that we plan to do this year weren't even on the list last year which my point was in fact the very first one riverside road in thurzo is the best example it's the top one on the list of 180 but last year it wasn't a, it wasn't a worry at all no no you're quite right and it is just um for some reason it's gone um <sighs> Roads, I mean, I, I, any any additional money that we have received recently has been gratefully received, but it's like any, we are a construction industry and so it takes us time to mobilise this money, to resource the, the behind the scenes to be able to spend it. So roads is a long term thing and and likewise, when we've had the cuts of years gone, and we've not been able to maintain our roads and roads can take up to 10 years even more before they start showing signs that they've not been <clears throat> maintained um and so and sometimes it could be simply that the drainage that was hoping just give up it could be some without doing cores and structural assessment there's no way of knowing exactly what what's caused these things to go but it's I mean, as I say, it, this is a moving target. This is a dynamic list. I've given you a snapshot at the time. And as you say, I mean, some roads, they hold up and then all of a sudden they are just right at the end of their life. And so what looks good one month, you could have a, a weather incident and they've just said, no, I've, I've got nothing left to give. And it can be where they are, the drainage they've received. It could be if they've, um, the level of traffic if it's suddenly increased you know i mean the the one at riverside if we'd have the level of tourists that we had four or five years ago pre-covid pre-nc 500 that road might have held up a bit longer you know you're starting to look at all these factors that could have an impact on why a road has gone quicker and 
you know, without sitting on top of that road and monitoring it, you'll never probably know the full exact answer. Um, there's so many factors that can have an impact on these sort of things. All I can say is we try to bring you as comprehensive a list as possible with the resources we've got. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josie. OK, Josie, thanks. Um, I think, Jan, you're next. Hello, Jan. Hi. Yeah, awesome. I'm here. Thanks, Joseph. Um, and, th and thanks for your report. And I really wouldn't like your job. And I've spoken to you before about this. Um, <coughs> I know I am just going to concentrate on Caithness. I am not interested in Sky or Badsby and Strasby or Inverness or Dingwall. I am just going to concentrate on Caithness, Josie. Um, I have opened my emails every day and I get photographs, potholes, photographs. I walked down my road last week from Newton Hill down, down to the town and I have videos of it. The roads are actually not fit for purpose now. The roads in Wick are getting like third world, third world country roads. Um, um, Raymond spoke about the the graveyard road at the graveside. It is bad, but there are roads here in Wick 20 times worse than that road. I got them down that road and it's nothing compared to a lot of the other roads. And I know it all comes down to budgets and you're restricted. And I know there was extra funding for COVID and this, that and the next thing. And <clears throat> I've actually had somebody on the on the phone to me saying she's thinking giving up her work because she finds it too dangerous to drive to work. Because when it's wet, she can't see the potholes. If it's dark, she can't see the potholes. If it's snowing, she can't see the potholes. And it's getting to the stage um, motorists are actually frightened to drive in some of the roads in Wick. And obviously, Caithness, they are so bad. They're getting it's such a health and safety issue now. And I think we really have to go back to um, the administration. And I mean, I, I've been driving these roads for 30 years and I've never seen them so bad all over the country for 30 years. And I've never seen them so bad. And I, I feel as though it's the further north you, you go from Inverness, the worse the roads get. Um, and I know there is potholes in Inverness as well, but they seem to get fixed like that. Unfortunately, Raymond, we are we are not in the same position. Our potholes aren't fixed the same day that you actually notice them. So you are in a more fortunate position than the rest of us. Um, and I think we really have to go back to the Scottish Government and ask for more funding because this is getting to be ludicrous. 178 roads needing repaired. And that is the tip of the iceberg. It's just a tip of the iceberg. I'm actually quite, and I know it's not your fault, and I was speaking to some of your uh, workers was sorting the road up at Tesco, and my hats go out off to them. I mean, they are absolutely the stars of your, your unit. Um, and they're even embarrassed with the state of the roads. You know, they're even, they won't even mention that they work with the roads now. That's how embarrassed they are. And it's not their fault, and it's not your fault. It's down to the... Um, the funding and where do we get the funding? We get it from the Scottish Government in Westminster. So I think we need to um, go get more funding for us um, because our roads aren't safe now. They're really not safe. That's, and thank you for the report, Josie. And I'm not getting at you because I know you work so hard with the very limited resources you've got. It's our duty to try and get you more resources. Um, the comments that we're getting through Facebook, hear that and everything is what's the councillors doing about our roads? Well, it's time as, as councillors spoke out about the state of the roads and tried to get more funding for Josie to do her job properly. Thank you. OK, Jan, thanks very much for that. Um, Wally, put your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Well, excuse me, but I'm going down a different road from the comments I've heard this afternoon. Yeah, thank you, Josie, very much indeed, Joanne. I like to call you Joanne. Myself being a regular attender at the Rhodes Monthly Meetings, I welcome this report. And as I've always said, I've been a strong supporter of our Rhodes team and our operatives in Caithness. In welcoming this report, knowing that you have given the capital programme a lot of thought as to recommend to us the priorities, along with our resources and materials, coupled with the funding available, which is not very easy. But well done, and I'll always praise the roads team no matter where I go, irrespective of the condition of the roads. So well done, Josie, and your team. And I look forward to this work being undertaken. Thank you, Chair. 
Okay, well, hey, thank you. Um, Carl? Hey, thank you, Ron. Um, uh, like Wally, I, I'm going to give you slightly different comments than we've gone before with the other members. Um, I, look, I, I always think we've got to look at providing solutions. We all understand what the problems are. And, and I, I've got to say that I find it difficult when these roads conditions we understand and we've agreed in the past how they emerge it's because of uh, uh, underspends and, and uh, budget cuts over a number of years i think it's generally accepted it goes back over 20 years so but having said all that we've got to start finding solutions so i guess my question is over josie it's for for some of the members that are only uh, particularly members who have served in previous terms matthew not least yourself i mean you were vice chair of budget committee and, and they presided over massive um budget underspends but what what are they what are the solutions are we seriously going to go back to scottish or uk government in that context and expect them to dole out more money so you know i think we need to ask ourselves um, there were also comments about the redesign process. I mean, that redesign process has seen um, over recent years uh, an investment in new equipment. We, before we had guys going behind lorries with shovels, I've seen that in recent times, uh, no, in recent times, before I was a councillor. But, you know, we, we've moved on. We, we've got a, a Pothole Pro a machinery um, and, and very different processes. But, you know, you would expect to hear comments or or... Um, support for a redesign process, but I mean, you'd also expect us to to hear queries on on what we're going to do in terms of further redesign to to address the issues. And obviously, money is required, but I, I just don't think, and, and I fully, I think, I think we can uh, almost predict what the press will be later on this week. I, I certainly do. I, I can imagine what the headlines are going to be now. I've seen some of the, the recent headlines and, and the confusion around that. But you know, I think. Um, Rational people in our communities, they, they, they understand and uh, accept uh, some uh, rationale if, if chosen. Anything, if I'd been at Community Council Associations, for example, and the uh, roads officers uh, briefing the general public, I, th I think there's an acceptance of that. I think, so look, what, what do I, uh, some of the things I want to see myself, I think, uh, Raymond, you spoke about absolute clarity at start, uh, your initial contribution. I, I think it'd be really useful for officers, members and, and the general public if absolute clarity could be, be provided. Uh, to my mind, I think Josie's probably delivered a similar update on, on the technical terms, because I forget what they are and I'm sure other members do. But look, if we could have something, a simplified version so the public can understand um, a, you know, a type of briefing that Josie gives us uh, available on council websites. I think that would be useful, whether it's short, short videos or whatever. I, I don't think it would be ter terribly difficult to do, but I think a, a, a value in that would be very useful as we move forward. But um, I'll be interested to hear uh, further contributions, and um, I would uh, I would like to amend the recommendation to to seek that we. Uh, do some kind of further exercise in in, in way of communications, as I alluded to earlier. So I'll maybe come back in later on. Thank you. Okay, Carl. Thanks. Um, Matthew, have you got your hand up, or is it a historical one? No, it's a new one, Chet. So I'll risk okay. um, putting the camera on. Um, I actually agree with some of what Carl said. Uh, I don't think it's the whole truth, though. I think one factor that is symptomatic of Caithness more so than any other area is the uh, almost explosion in the use of heavy goods vehicles on the minor roads, the different projects, timber extraction, onshore wind farms. And I've quoted this so many times, a previous roads engineer that some of us will remember, Mr Ian Moncrief, told councillors at a meeting some years ago, one loaded HGV full of timber was roughly equivalent wear and tear wise to a thousand cars. I don't know if Josie agrees, I don't want to put her on the spot with that one, but I remember that figure. I think it explains a great deal. 
because the minor roads in the county, the ones, as Josie has just reminded us, only get surveyed once every 10 years, and a lot can happen in a month, let alone nine years. Um, you know, the damage to these roads, they were just simply in plain English, never ever designed for these types of vehicles. And that could be a reason why, in my judgment, Caithness is the area with the worst roads and that is subjective, totally concede it, but I believe it to be the truth in the Highland Council area. Um, I'm going to be blunt, I think, you know, people, the public have been told about the redesign board. It might save bits around the edges. It's been on the go for many years. The public have made up their own mind just from walking along pavements, waiting at pothole taxi ranks or driving their cars and paying the repair bills. They can see for themselves and frankly, I think it's they're intelligent, they've made up their minds, they can see what the problems are. Um, there was one question, Josie, I think I asked you, but I'm just going to repeat it. If we don't get more money, may I ask, what is your professional opinion? And none of us are professionals on this. What's your opinion on the direction of travel for our roads? And as an aside, do I've been asking for it for two or three weeks. Is the annual roads condition maintenance survey actually available yet for us or for members? Thank you. OK, thank you, Matthew. Josie, do you want to? Yeah, um, yeah. what I will, I'll, I'll actually just go back to Councillor Rosie's um, uh, suggestion of a, a information sheet of, of what things are. Part of the roads redesign process, there is a proposal to do roads fact sheets and have a lot more information out there on the council website for the public. So that is something that's in progress. Um, Coming back to Councillor Rees, um, the direction of our roads, there will it will be more challenging to work out which road that you want fixed if the pot of money for capital is remains as it is. Um, and what you will see that there is a bit greater burden on the revenue budget to try and keep doing the, the pothole repairs in that respect. And it may well be that you um you know we find other ways of doing it or repairs just it, it's going to be a difficult thing and I know I said at a committee pre pre covid that you know it, there may be some roads that become unbound you know um with refer to a lot of our single track roads across highland a lot of them were undesigned a lot of roads that were tracks have just had some tar laid on them and they weren't that they haven't been designed for anything than the old Bedford van that you probably had running around them in the 50s, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So, yes, HGVs, I will touch on timber. The timber industry, unless we stick a weight restriction on a road, there is no way of stopping a timber lorry running on a road because then it impacts all lorries of that size. So any deliveries, oil, gas, whatever, you know, goes on there. So there's there is that challenge, a balance we have to strike. However, the timber industry come together and they work in consultation with us. So they don't just run roughshod. We can we can engage in, in um timber extraction plans so that the you know they have to run at a certain speed, their tire pressure. But also the Scottish Government have recognised this and that's where the strategic timber transport schemes come in and the bids can be made. That's the timber industry which is one. Any other big development that goes through a formal planning process, we have an opportunity at that planning process to engage with the contractors. And that, however, you do have some in Caithness, the harbours that have permitted development, so they don't go through a planning process. There is no way of, of catching them at the start. And the quarries already have existing planning permissions, so there is no way of, of closing that door, if you like, and es establishing quarry routes. So they do have the, f the freedom of the roads, if you like, and th that's where our challenges can lie. Everybody wants to see development, but, you know, it's trying to manage it and trying to have that balance for everybody. Um, it's one. I will just touch on the, the road condition survey. That is managed centrally. It's not something I have an oversight of to, to know when it come comes out. Um, as I say, the U-class roads are surveyed 
roughly every 10 years because the 10 percent gets done each year. However, our roads inspector does go over them on an annual basis. You know, some will be maybe quarterly, but the majority of them will be annually. So whilst that condition survey only goes over once every 10 years, we are out there a lot more frequently. Um, and if the, I mean, the roads inspector might be on them, but you might find our our dry guys are on them or our technical team are out on them. So that's where our list builds from in that respect. But when that comes out, that data, I'm, I can't, I don't know. It's um, It's managed by our central strategic team. Thank you. Chair, can I just ask, I mean, this is one where just the thing about the timber extraction in particular and the renewables that, you know, if it was possible politically to get the rules changed so that the roads got put up to standard before development happened, then a lot of these problems in the remote rural areas, I'm thinking places like Westerdale, these kind of areas, the Mipes to Watton Road, apologies, it's not my ward. You know, if those roads, if it was a condition of these developments, the roads were done first, then we wouldn't have the problems and we'd actually end up with a better road in return for getting the development as well. Um, <coughs> thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Um, Jan, your hand up or is that historic? No, my hand's still up. Thank you very much. And thank you, jo Josie, for being so honest and straightforward with your comments there in reply to Matthew. That was Bit, and I know you're under a terrible strain and I commend all your road officers and whatnot. Um, I will just get back to something Carol said. I actually saw the men out with a shovel filling potholes in off the back of Laurie last the other week there, you know, down at um, Rosebank at the traffic lights and where else? I saw them somewhere else um, at the West Banks and whatnot. So they are still doing it that the old fashioned way. So they are. So hats off to them. They are really trying their best to do what they can under the circumstances. And I still think it goes back down to pots and it's pots of money and we need pots of money. So where do we get the pots of money? We have to go back to the governments. OK, thank, thanks, Jan. Um, Carl, is that come in or is that history? Yeah, look, just a point on what Jan said earlier. Now, I'm I'm going to imagine that uh, guys with shovels in this day and age were doing a, a cold repairs, but this is why we've got to be we've got to be really careful around the language that we use because we're being unfair to the roads team by do making that point, you know. But and it go, again, it goes back to the point about having um, a better communication for for people to understand what's why what they're doing and when they're doing it, but. Uh, jo Joseph, maybe correct you. Correct me on what, what I said there, but I'd imagine it'd be cold repairs that was being done. I think it was cold repairs, Carol, but they were still doing it. They were still a shovel shoving off the back of lorry. And all credit to them. I mean, really, all credit to them. They are, you know, the the heroes that they trying to get the roads up to, to standards, but they can only do it with the resources they've got, Carol. And that all comes down to pots of money and they haven't got them. Josie hasn't got the money. So the only way we can help Josie and help the community up here in Cape Next is by asking for more money. So we need to ask for more money. You're shaking your head, Rose, Carol. So we don't yeah, need more we money. Need a proper, we need a proper debate. <laughs> thing that. I don't agree with what you're saying. There, but, you know, we need point of order. A point of order, Chair, can we please uh, um, direct our comments through the Chair and uh, put our hands up, please? Yeah, thank you, Ryan, for that. Yeah. Um, Jan, are you finished? Yeah, OK. Yes, uh, thank you. Carl? No? OK. R Raymond, do you want to come in? Yeah, I think, you know, um, we're all agreed, actually, um, in terms of the fact that the the state of the roads isn't isn't great. And Sorry, I was just muting myself. <laughs> um, yeah, we're all agreed. Uh, the state of the roads isn't good, and the state of the roads has, has been getting uh, progressively worse. Uh, and and what we're here to do today, as far as I'm concerned, is to agree the capital program that's been put forward to us uh, by by Josie. And I don't think any of us are going to uh, fall out by agreeing that. You know, I think what we're talking about is how do we get more money uh, and and how do we get a recovery position? Um, I recall when I first got elected, and that's why I can understand Jan's frustration, because, you you know, when you're newly elected and you and you're and then you get faced with uh, the limitations of uh, of what you can do with what you've got, it's really, really frustrating. 
When I when I got first elected in um, in two thousand and seventeen, Matthew was in exactly the same position. Um, you know, and Matthew will recall when uh, William Gilfillan stood on his feet in the in the chamber and said, "Members, to uh, to to um, to repair all your roads, all you need to do is agree to give me a hundred and seventy seven million pounds." And sarcastically, somebody in the chamber shouted, "Agreed." Um, and that was and that was uh, that was what uh, Matthew was facing then. And despite what Matthew and the budget team and the administration at that time uh, tried to do and through money, it wasn't until two years later that we landed up getting 20 million pounds divided up by all the areas, including Caithness. And that's why Caithness went from its base budget of around about 700,000 to 1.2 million two years ago and 1.5 million in the current year that we're in. Um, and that's why we're talking about base budgets here. So base budgets are going to be something that we're going to be looking at until uh, until the uh, special meeting of council uh, takes place on this on the 2nd of March. And we do that and the challenge that we've got with fuel crisis, energy crisis, cost of living crisis, inflation, uh, a peak and what have you. But there's nothing stopping us um, agreeing the, the list that we've got today for Caithness. Um, that, that, that's it in a nutshell. I think what um, we need, what we need to do, and Carl, I was saying, I was hearing you were looking to put something in the chat, uh, or Jan was asking you to put it in the chat. But um, it's myself that uh, wants to put forward a motion, um, and I'm happy to put it in the chat. And if anybody wants to add to that, but it's simply um, that we we know. I mean, we're no, we're we're agreeing with it. I can't see us not agreeing with the with the recommendations, but. Um, the the motion I've got here is uh, to add to the recommendations that the capital programme for roads be included in the agenda at the next Caithness Area Committee to consider any impact that the Council's uh, special meeting on the 2nd of March may have on the programme. And I don't think that's, uh, you know, I think that's what we would all like to see uh, happen. We have the ability to be able to just agree what we've got today, know what the frustrations are there, just not just for Caithness, but for every other area as well. But to come back and see what we can do um, beyond uh, beyond the budget, because we can't do anything other than agree the base budget today. So, um, and and that would you know take the frustrations and everything out of what we're what we're talking about just now, because it's all um, it, it's it's all uh, semantical when you look at what we've actually got to do today. Agree the agree the listing, agree the base budget. Um, and let Josie get on with what she's got to do with what she's presented us. Uh, then it's up to members how we manage to uh, to assist and tackle that going forward. So that's probably the last that I'm going to um, stay on it um, from a Caithness perspective today. I'll put it in the chat. Thanks. OK, Raymond, <clears throat> thanks for that. Um, Matthew, are you uh, coming come back? Yeah, I mean, what Raymond said there is is not a bad summary. And as far as it goes, um, genuinely, um, but I frankly, I just feel that we owe it to the public and Councillor McEwen himself have both said this. Um, it's a simple mathematical thing. You can look at these figures. Primary school maths would do it. We simply haven't got the money. And I think, and I'll explain why, I think the roads are breaking up quite quickly, a lot faster than we're fixing them. And my reasoning is again that half of those projects that we're going to be doing this year, they weren't even Josie didn't, we didn't even know about them last year. That's how quickly that the situation is changing. So I'm happy to discuss it. Every Caithness committee, there's a strong argument saying we should be discussing it at every committee until it's sorted out. But in the meantime, my own view is at least we need to be saying to our government, to the Scottish government, via our MSP, with whom I think I've met personally twice about this, <coughs> say this has gone beyond the council. We can't do it financially. And Raymond's right, Mr. Gilfillan did stand up and make and make make say that. The really serious point is that that figure has increased a lot since he said that. It's out of control. It is out of control. We need to face up to it. And the only people who can now help us are the government. And so I think what Raymond's saying, yeah, great to discuss it at the next committee, but we need to go further and we need to do it like right now, because each day there are people going into garages with burst wheels, tyres, springs. We need to do something about it. OK, Matthew, thank you. Um, thank Matt, you. do you want to come in there? You got your hand up. No? 
Yeah, sorry, I was just reaching for my microphone there. Uh, I'm just wondering if the chair would want to go for an adjournment so we can discuss how we can move this forward. In respect of the amendments? Yeah. Or amendment? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, yep. uh, Carl, you want to come in there quick or no? I'm quite content to second the uh, uh, motion that's in the chat. If that helps the process. Sorry, I thought there was more than one motion in the chat. Bear with. Don't think there is, no. Oh, I don't think there is, Mark. I think I think we've okay. uh, chair. I think that um, we, we've all. Oh, sorry. Just sorry, about one, uh, one, one at a uh, time, please. Yeah. Sorry, Councillor Bremner. It was just to get a consolidated um, agreement about the way forward. Um, I think it, I think I would uh, suggest what Mark has proposed as maybe a quick adjournment for the members. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, we'll go with that if, if that's what you're um, um, suggesting. Come back maybe at two o'clock. Well, we'll we'll come back online at two o'clock or something. But we'll call the members and uh, Joanne in to uh, uh, just a quick chat room. About a we'll order forward. here, Chair. We've got, we've got one motion in, in the chat, which we all understand, and it's competent. And you've got a seconder. OK, that's that's fine. I was going to suggest another way forward, but if that's what you want to do. Chair, sure, I've got my hand up. OK, Raymond. I'm happy to hear what uh, I'm happy to hear any uh, suggestions by the officers. And, 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 you know, but in a recess, that's fine. Yes, I would prefer to do it in a recess. Thank you. Yeah, okay, I would well, like I would like a little comfort break. Thank you. <laughs> OK. We'll have a recess, then we'll we'll go for a recess and come back at um, five past two. OK, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, we're we're <clears throat> back in here live again. Um, we're at the position where um just want to sum up what's been said earlier. Um, I just want to add that the short time has been a councillor. The, the one thing that I've had more complaints about is, is the road condition. And uh, I recently attended three community council meetings and they were very concerned about the condition of our roads and streets and I'm afraid many roads are an embarrassment to our, our wonderful county and something needs to be done. We, we missed out on the level up fund for the North Coast 500 and um, what I propose to do now is ask for approval for the proposed prioritised area roads capital programme for Caithness and I wish to add that we agree to write to the Scottish Government that the Highland Council, but particularly Caithness, needs additional urgent capital investment. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Raymond, are you wanting to come in there? Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Um, first of all, um, I would like to withdraw uh, the the motion that I had uh, formally said that I was going to submit um, because I believe that the chair can actually request for that to be put on the agenda at any given time um, to be able to further review the roads capital program uh, at future meetings and with uh, uh, and acknowledging um, the the motion that's been uh, put into the uh, chat there just now I think uh, Caithness members will agree that uh, Whilst I'm, a, whilst I'm a Caithness member, I'm also the leader of the council, and it would put me. Uh, I, I this it would be difficult for me to agree to uh, to, to a motion um, that particularly uh, reflects on one uh, single area of the council, given the fact that I am the leader of the council. Um, so I will uh, I'll hold a neutral position uh, on this, um, please, um, and leave it to the other Caithness, and leave it to the Caithness members. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Raymond, for that. So, um, are we all in agreement with the way forward now? Helen has her hand up. Sorry. Oh, sorry, he Helen. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I suggest that we add the word roads into the motion to just to be absolutely clear, so that it asks for urgent capital roads investment? Because yes. obviously we've been discussing yes. that, but it doesn't actually yes. have the roads word in there. Definitely. Yes. I, I, I get the point. Yes. I'll add that. <laughs> well caught. Well caught, Helen. Yes. yes. Well caught. Thank you, Helen. After all, it was a roads we were discussing. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> okay, folks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, yep, we were all in agreement with that one. Anyway, thanks, and with Raymond's comments as well. So, right, we'll move on now to item nine: wet public service obligation. And I believe David is here to go through the report. Oh, Raymond, are you wanting to come in quickly there, or very quickly, just to reiterate the we uh, the, I made this comment earlier in the in the meeting, but I think I should reiterate it just now. Um, I have a connection to this item, given the fact that I am the chair of the Wick John O'Groats uh, Consultative Committee. But I don't think that having reviewed the content of the paper, that it precludes me from taking a. Um, part in this item, uh, nor that I have uh, a declaration to declare. Thanks. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you. Welcome, David. You've had a long wait, I'm afraid. <laughs> we, we had a few things to sort out. So. Oh, it's, it's been uh, educational. <laughs> educational, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, yeah, good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'll, I'll try and keep this as, as succinct as I can. Um, I've obviously um, presented you with a paper. I don't propose to go through it, it, it line by line or anything, but I thought it would be helpful maybe to go through some of the key points and just to give you a little bit more of the background and the context, some of the um, some of the items in the paper. Um, so just a very quick background, obviously, for those who aren't um, or who weren't perhaps involved in some of the initial work around the PSO. Um, the original business case was developed back in uh, around 2017, 2018 by Caithness Chamber of Commerce, um, submitted to Transport Scotland, and um, the service has been in place now between Wick and Aberdeen since April 2022. Um, and I was appointed as the project officer in July. Um, <clears throat> Going through some of the key points in the report, um, obviously I just wanted to sort of start off um, looking at some of the implications that I'd identified. So in terms of resource, I've obviously mentioned, um, you know, we've allocated around 155,000 of the, the council's budget to date, um, with around 145,000 um, still to be spent. I um, appreciate that's quite a, a substantial underspend. I just wanted to give a little bit of, of context to that. Um, I think firstly to bear in mind we've effectively missed a whole quarter of spend um, between April and, and July with me not being in post so so there's a chunk there. Um, I wanted to be very very prudent about it um, looking at the fuel price cost adjuster mechanism we we agreed with Eastern um, you know in the first quarter our the council's liability there was around £35,000 um, I was very conscious that if we weren't able to stem that, we were looking at around £100,000 over the course of the year. So wanted to be um, careful that we didn't leave ourselves in a position where, where we were faced with a, you know, a significant liability and no, no budget to cover it. Um, that position is now stabilised. Um, I do believe we want to keep a careful eye on things and not act too quickly. Um, as, as I'm sure you all know, things are still uh, very much in flux. Um, and the other point really is that the original marketing efforts um, through the first year of the, the PSO were very focused on business, um, and that was much more of a, a time resource than a financial resource. Um, however, what's become clear is that we need to um, refocus efforts on the leisure market, and that will involve a, a significant degree of, of marketing spend. Um, so just, just to give a little context around where I could see some of that resource being used in, in year two. Um, moving on to the risk portion, um, I have obviously mentioned um, that there is a, a risk here, and I believe uh, Councillor Rees um, identified that has been picked up um, by the local press, um, and there was a story on Friday, I believe, um, around that. Uh, so I wanted to give a bit of context on that as well. Um, the financials we receive on a quarterly basis from Eastern Airways, um, and those have shown um, that as it stands, um, Eastern are making a loss on this particular service. Um, that position has improved as we've gone from Q1 to Q3, um, but I did want to identify that there is a risk there, um, both in terms of the service itself and also, I, I suppose, a financial risk to Eastern as an operator. Um, I guess to reassure members, we've had many, many detailed discussions with Eastern and stakeholders over the past weeks as we've as we've looked at these figures. 
um, all parties are very, very keen to find a position which allows us to continue delivering this service and to do so in a sustainable fashion. Um, I'm currently having discussions with Eastern Airways, modelling out what we think a year two sustainable service might look like. Um, we're very keen that we maintain as high a level of service as possible and to keep within those kind of core lifeline service deliveries. So uh, double daily, um, core business day at both ends of the route. Um, what, we're, what we really need to examine is where some of our big loss making sectors are and how we can maybe rationalise some of those. I'll, I'll cover some of that under um, kind of future actions. Um, what is looking likely is that at the moment we have a, a early flight on a Monday and a Tuesday. Um, it seems likely that those would be removed in a year to schedule. Um, I would just like to highlight, and because we're in the risk section, that that would actually reduce some other risks that we're currently looking at, particularly around uh, winter resilience. Obviously, flying early in the winter is is a risk when it comes to weather. Um, and we're also very conscious around um, air traffic control cover at Wick John and Groats. So rationalising the service down to a, a more of a business day um, would help mitigate against some of that risk. Uh, moving on, I suppose, to the meat of the report, obviously around the passenger numbers and the forward modelling of these. Um, as you can obviously see from the report, um, we are concerned the passenger numbers do continue to be well below um, the projected levels. Um, what this boils down to essentially is we've not seen the return of business travel demand in anything like the way that was was projected uh, post COVID. Um, and we're estimating, I would say we're probably about 25% of where we thought business travel would be. Um, we can see some improvement um, from the August schedule change that was brought in. Um, you can see that going up through August, September, October. Um, to, to, to give some of the wider context again, I've had discussions with, with HIAL and Highlands and Islands Airports. Um, I've had discussions with Transport Scotland. They are both seeing similar positions um, nationwide. Um, and Eastern, as I understand it, are also seeing very similar challenges on their New Key London PSO. Um, and across some of their commercial services as well. Um, so to, again, to put it in context for members, this, this is a challenge that's facing regional aviation um, across the whole of Europe, um, as evidenced by the failure of Flybe um, just earlier this month. Um, I mentioned in the forward modelling section um, that we were looking at a, a sort of 40 to 50% increase in uh, passenger demand and passenger revenue. Um, I've actually redone those figures very recently just based on, on some of the Q3 financials that I've received. Um, so more positively, um, and particularly if we model in a, a £10 increase in the base fare price, um, that brings the position much closer to sustainability. Um, it still requires some intervention. Um, but it brings us closer to a 20 to 30 percent increase required as opposed to 40 to 50 percent. Um, so a positive step in the right direction. Um, again, we can start to see some evidence from uh, over the festive period. We introduced a very reduced schedule just between Christmas and New Year. Um, this worked tremendously well for us. We didn't see a drop in demand, um, but we did see um, you know, an obvious drop in, in, in cost there. Now, um, I, we're certainly not proposing going back to anything as, as um, drastic as a single daily service as we did then, but it, it gives some evidence that there is scope to rationalise the timetable in a way which, which cuts out loss making services while retaining demand. Um, again, if I look at those Monday, Tuesday early services, um, we can see a consistently higher usage of the 11.45 on Mondays and Tuesdays than the 7.55. So the question is, what we need to look at really, you know, can we rationalise that? Can we bring in a, a change to the timetable which captures both those demand points um, and still retains all the core con connectivity that people are looking for? Um, just to update members as well, I'm currently engaged with Dunray Site Restoration Limited um, about their travel policy and what they're looking to do in terms of um, supporting the uh, the public service obligation, and I actually have a call with uh, with them tomorrow morning um, to discuss that. Uh, moving on to performance and reliability, um, 
while I would like to see some improvement here, um, I, just to 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 um, to give a quick summary, um, we're looking at about an average of eighty percent on time arrival. Um, personally, I would like to see that moving up. In an ideal world, that would be high eighties or uh, low nineties. Um, however, as you can see from the other figures around it, we are we're not living in an ideal world for aviation right now. Um, domestic services out of Aberdeen are sitting about 60% on time and across the UK about 50%. Um, so in that context, I, I believe 80% is, is quite an achievement. Um, I'm conscious I didn't include cancellation statistics and I'm happy to circulate those afterwards. Um, but again, just to update members very quickly, um, that's been very strong overall. Um, we're sitting at around a 96% average of services delivered. Um, with our worst month being August at 89%. Um, and that was purely down to major issues with fog, both ends of the route, um, both, both Wick and Aberdeen, as, as tends to happen if, if one is socked in with fog, so is the other. Um, and just looking at our most recent performance figures, um, we saw very, very strong performance October and December. And again, the worst month was October at 96% of services delivered. Um, again, weather related fog at either Wick or Aberdeen. Moving on to ongoing and future work. Um, as I've mentioned, we are currently exploring operations for uh, options, sorry, for how we uh, rationalise the schedule. Um, still moving around, I, I can't give an update on exactly what we're proposing at this point because there's a lot of, of considerations going into that. Um, we need to think about um, availability of slots at Aberdeen, um, what the demands are at the wick end of the route, um, and in particular making sure that we continue to capture all the core onward connectivity that's been identified. So destinations Manchester, London, Birmingham, um, all very strong connecting markets for us. Um, as I've noted, it's not just a question of schedule. Um, one of the things that we need to look at is, as well as we come into year two, is the pricing structure. Um, I have mentioned and um, we're proposing to put a £10 increase on the, the baseline fare. Um, so that would go up from 49.99 entry point to 59.99. Uh, my belief and the belief of the commercial director at Eastern is that that is a reasonable increase and one which will not unduly impact on demand. Um, we don't believe that price demand sensitivities would come into play at, at, at that differentiation in price point. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Without going too far into the arcane intricacies of airline pricing, um, the standard model on which everyone operates effectively is leisure passengers book early and book cheap, business passengers book late and book expensive. If we don't have that business demand, we need to look at then how can we drive some of those higher fares and look at maybe a less price sensitive leisure market. And that's going to be a real focus of some of the route marketing work that we're looking at coming into year two. Um, coming on to that, um, I mentioned I've, um, we've um, allocated uh, £5,000 out of the PSO budget um, and I have contracted a marketing company called 3X1 um, who have significant experience in aviation. Um, to undertake some dedicated route marketing in uh, Manchester and in Belfast, which are two of our key connecting destinations. Um, so really looking at how we drive some inbound tourism from those destinations. Um, I have just finished a survey with uh, Caithness Chamber of Commerce to look at um, business travel demand coming into 2023. Uh, unfortunately, this isn't telling us anything we didn't already know. Um, just 35% of businesses are saying they expect an increase in travel um, in, in 2023 um, and continually identify uh, growth in virtual meetings as a driver behind that. Um, we will continue to push this where we can. I understand there are certain um, major employers in, in Caithness who may have some, some big projects coming up and we'll look to, to work with them specifically. Um, and just additionally to update members, um, there's a number of additional projects I'm hoping to deliver over the remainder of of year one um, around the PSO. So not not direct um, aviation related activities, but things like 
um, STEM outreach um, to local schools, for example, um, doing some charitable efforts linked in with, with Aberdeen Airport and one of their charity partners um, and linking in some active travel as aspects to the airport. Just to, to, to sum up at the end, um, I just wanted to say, you know, I, I appreciate um, that this report is not a wholly positive um, piece of reading. Um, I'm conscious that was something that was very picked up on in the, the press reporting. Um, you know, I don't want to sugarcoat it. This has been a difficult first year. We've learned, had to learn a lot of lessons. Things have not been um, what we expected them to be. Um, but I am confident that with the right interventions and adjustments, we can get this to a sustainable position in year two. Um, and again, to update members, we have a very good working relationship with Eastern as the contractor here. Um, very willing to to work with us to be pragmatic, as uh, as I believe was the phrase that Councillor Bremner used earlier in the meeting, um, and to come up with something that works for for both us and for them um, to build something sustainable. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, David. Thank you very much for that. Uh, has any um, members got anything to say? And we realise the time, so if we can just keep it kind of brief, it would help. Thanks very much. Raymond? Yeah, um, thanks, David. And uh, thanks for the work that everybody's been putting in over the over the months and uh, years, to be quite honest. Um, Caseness members um, who were part of the uh, previous um, um, term of council um, club together um, wrote um, for it to uh, petition to get the the money to be able to support this. We got it. Uh, it wasn't easy, but what we have to do is uh, be seen to be doing absolutely everything we possibly can to be able to maintain this PSO insofar as council and its partners can. I mean, we can't force businesses and we can't force people onto the planes if they don't want to. But what we don't want to hear is that they couldn't get onto the planes uh, because the prices were too high or the modelling of the pricing was um, uh, was um, uh, you know preclusive. Um, and I and as far as I know, to the best of our ability, we've always uh, tried to maintain that. We've highlighted any issues to Eastern Airways if and when they've uh, come up. I know that um, David, maybe it might be something for you to look at, uh, but I have had representation even in the past twenty four hours that advanced bookings uh, as far in, uh, as far as in October for a mother and two of her children has come in around about the 400 and odd pound mark. I can't imagine that that price modelling so far in advance is delivering those kind of prices, but maybe you could look at that. But uh, generally, um, we've, we've been trying to do our best. When I said about being pragmatic, I meant being pragmatic because we have to be pragmatic as well as realistic. If we're wanting this to work, we've got to look at all the options. And if some some of the flights are not being supported, despite us doing absolutely everything that we have possibly uh, managed to do to achieve um, getting folks on the planes, then we have to maybe look at other things. Um, but at this moment in time, we've still got to have that positive outlook. Um, and that includes looking at reviewing our, our options. We have heard from the public that the uh, the public generally who are uh, supporting the Aberdeen flight at the moment, which generally it was businesses that were saying that they were going to do that. If you go back to the public, the public would uh, are saying that they would rather an Edinburgh flight, and they were saying that even right back at the time that we were looking to award um, a PSO route to either Edinburgh or Aberdeen, but Edinburgh was just completely unaffordable. So we've got to make sure that we are doing everything we possibly can and and give the public the assurance that that's the case. Because again, I'll say it: if we don't use it. We will lose it, but it, it can't. It ha cannot be put. Uh, but the, the we can't be seen to be losing it because we didn't do everything that we we uh, we could possibly to be able to maintain it and keep it sustainable. Thanks, David, for all the work you're doing. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, Matthew. Yes. Um, thanks, David. Nice to see you all. Be it's just on this horrible little screen rather than meeting for real with a cup of tea and a bacon butty. Maybe one day we'll get back to that. Yes, I see the council leader raising his eyebrows in approval. Yes, um, actually talking of approval, pretty much agree with everything Raymond's just been saying, I think. Um, David, it's sort of slightly, you reminded me a little bit of a sort of doctor trying to smoothly reassure a slightly sickly patient that actually all will be well. And I hope that is the case, but um, you've given us a pretty honest, you know, unsugarcoated thing there. I'm going to be blunt. I I can't really recall seeing any 
publicity really about the flights and I remember years ago when I used to go to the airport meetings um, and we had the air discount scheme which I understand cannot be applied when it's a PSO you can correct me if I'm wrong on that but it's a great shame because and I remember um, sort of trying to help persuade a gentleman from the government um, I don't think it's wrong to name it he was very helpful a, a Mr Bratcher Michael Bratcher I think was his name to do a leaflet drop around the county just a simple leaflet explaining what the services were and actually what the prices were because in those days the prices were pretty attractive and again what Councillor Bremner just said about the family and tickets for October 400 pounds yeah that I mean part of the reason I think the service failed before part of the reason was reputational damage the perception not always correct that it was unreliable and all the rest of it your figures here are really good pretty good so far I kind of worry that if you do put the price up you're saying only sort of 10 pounds mm, in this day and age people are counting every pound I pragmatic that word again if a service isn't getting many people on it I sort of see where you're coming from but I think the risk is oh word gets around the place of oh, the airport is you know the service is going the same way as it did last time so getting to the point rather laboriously you know are we doing everything we can to attract people um you're saying you're going to take on consultants or marketing people to advertise the route effectively i mean i don't know do the government still supply stuff like the gentleman i was referring to a minute ago to do that sort of work for us can they do a, a leaflet drop which we all know from standing as members you know the the leaflet drop is still pretty good value for money when you think what it gets even for a councillor with his or her limited expenses you know for for yourselves as a business to get a leaflet around every home in the county and Sutherland for that matter it's not a huge expense so be very briefly at times marching on but briefly be interested to hear whether the whether the government can help you with this at all or whether leaflet drop or some something like that might be a possibility or maybe you're going to tell me you're doing them already anyway all, good luck with the future thank you Matthew David do you want to come back now? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, just very briefly to come back on on um, the point that Councillor Bremner raised. If you were able to provide me that, you know, in a suitably anonymised fashion, I can I can easily look into that and, and see what the pricing issue is there in October. Um, it does sound unusual. I'm um, so happy to look into that. Um, yeah, thank you, Councillor Rees. Um, so just to take your first point um, you're correct ADS can't apply on on a PSO service and um, because it's already being funded by Scottish government it, 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 they would count it as a, as a double funding exercise okay um in terms of targeting the leisure market um I would say uh, the honest answer is I we probably haven't done everything we can as I say the focus has been very much on the business market on trying to regain that business travel and yeah. um, it has been clear that that has not that is not going to materialise and that, that is absolutely my focus over the, the coming months. Um, in terms of leaflet drops, absolutely, that, that all that kind of thing. And, and some of this comes back to um, having a confidence in, in what, what we still have left within the budget as well. Um, lots of things that I possibly previously ruled out as being um, potentially prohibitively expensive. Print advertising is very expensive, for example. Um, may now become feasible um, but yes absolutely going to be looking over that over the next the next few months and especially as we look towards year two and um, to really try and drum up that interest as a as a, a spring summer 23 and um, so, sorry through through the chair if I may just just very before I forget on that point you're saying that print is expensive and that, that really surprises me because I think five or six thousand leaflets which we you know most of us did as members mm -hmm. was quote unquote only a few hundred quid Sorry, I, I, I do apologise. Um, when I talk, when I say print advertising, I, I was referring, I suppose, to, to print media. Um, so things like. Oh, sorry. Um, OK, OK. Yeah. Local papers and, and things like that, which which can be very expensive. Yes, I agree um, with you. Yes. Fine. But no, ab absolutely. Leaflet, leaflet drops are things that I've, I've priced out before and are very, very reasonable um, in terms of, of value for money. Um, I guess I would say happy to take suggestions if you, uh, I'm always looking for good ideas. Um, so if anyone has, yeah. OK, um, thank think, you. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thanks, thank thanks, you very David. much. Um, Andrew, you want to, as long as you can try and keep it kind of brief. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the focus on, on leisure is um, I mean, absolutely the right move. Um, and the the not failure, but the not as flourishing return to business travel as, as we've seen, I don't think is entirely to be expected, especially you know with, with the whole move to you know remote hybrid working. Um, you know, I you know, I I know my 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 other job I have that before lockdown. You know, it's you know based in Edinburgh. I simply wouldn't be able to do that at all. But you know, just due to the new ways of working, I I mean, do it almost entirely from home. You know, there's just been that shift. You know, completely. Um, but in terms of the the leisure market, I mean, not something that you know I, I would you know 100% use. But you know, it's just when you're thinking through, okay, you know, leisure travel. But what does that look like? Are we talking you know, simply? You know, people looking to travel to further destinations and flight is it a better option uh, or are we looking more at you know simple like return day outs to Aberdeen for shopping meals or or you know, whatever um, and as much as you know I know it's going to most likely annoy the the Chamber of Commerce and your know, suggestion of you know, going to somewhere else for for shopping rather than, than here thinking big picture having those kind of you know links and the availability of that is really sort of fundamental to the viability of Caithness population. Because I mean, if, if you're a, a, a not sure, a young person, I mean, almost anyone in Caithness now, you've seen the, the the decline of shops go down and down, and it, it's not just the lack of you know people shopping there; it's the general lack of population and a key driver of you know uh, the you know people leaving the area is just the lack of these local facilities. So you know, if you know, having you know that ease of access to you know city like shopping is actually what keeps people in the county, and they're there for you know the day to day spending in businesses and shops. You know, bigger picture that is better for the county and better for businesses um, in in Caithness. Uh, but just on that, I think because I mean I, when I, I, mean, I thought you know yeah brilliant I'll I'll do that hundred percent. But when you look at okay, so how easy is it to get from? You know Aberdeen Airport to Union Square because I mean that that's that's really you know, all the only place I want to go because Dice uh, train station is actually about two miles away from the airport and it's you know so what what are the bus what what are the options to actually get in so if we're going to be targeting you know, the leisure market and specifically for those day trip kind of things in any kind of awareness raising needs to be focused not just the getting to Aberdeen Airport is good you know, attractive and, and, and convenient, but also the onward, how you can get to and just taking it as a bit more of a, a, a package almost. Thank, thanks, Andrew. Is, uh, Jan, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I, I do think you should you should focus on leisure, David. Um, and I would certainly said, you know, suggesting as well, like, um, to concerts at the P&J or to the theatre, rather, you know, as well as shopping, because I know me as a fact, I have different ladies groups and we, we will go down to Edinburgh to, to do some shopping and go to the theatre or, you know, but um, so to promote, sorry, weekends in Aberdeen to the theatre and a shopping day and back, that that would be, it, it would really go down well with quite a lot of the females in the county uh, to get that, I mean, um, using up, um, Wick to go onwards. Me personally, I wouldn't use that, whereas I would use it from Wick to Edinburgh or Wick to Glasgow to go onwards to other continents and countries. But um, Wick to Aberdeen, no. Yeah, but for leisure, I would use it uh, if you would promote it, you know, for shows. And I'd, I, I'd, well, I don't know how many Aberdeen supporters are and whatnot for football and things like that as well. No, but it was promoted for all these things. Yeah, I think you could do quite well, David. Thank you. OK, David, do you want to come back there? Yeah? yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, I suppose in, in response to, to both Councillor Jarvie and, and Councillor McEwen, very similar points. Um, thank you very much for that. That's, that's really helpful. Um, just to update, uh, as I look at the leisure market, um, the, the three um, sort of big groups that I've identified, I guess, for targeting over the next few months are um, day weekend trips, um, as everyone's mentioned, um, things at the P&J, theatre, um, football is an obvious one. Uh, not that everyone's a big fan, but stag do's and hen do's, um, you know, these these kinds of things. Um, visiting friends and relatives. We've got a lot of parents with um, children at, at 
Aberdeen universities, for example, um, and then onward travel. Um, this will come more into year two as we start to refactor the schedule around the leisure traveller rather than the business traveller. Um, but looking at um, just just by way of example, as as we um, I think the 23rd of December, there was a connecting flight Wick Aberdeen, Aberdeen, uh, Tenerife, I think it was for something like £150. <laughs> You know, so trying trying to identify those those sorts of things and, 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 and push them out. Um, and just a, a minor question is it, it's absolutely um, a fair point and it's something that we will look to promote as a package. Um, very easy to get to Union Square from Aberdeen Airport. There's a bus every 15 minutes. OK, David, thank you very much for that. Yes, and best of luck for the future. I'm sure you'll you'll fight the corner there for, for the airport. I. <clears throat> Now we have to um, just note note the report. Is everybody happy with uh, noting the report? Yep. Okay, folks. Thanks very much for that one. Thanks, David. Yes, thanks, David. Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay, we we'll move on to item ten. Getting through it. HRE Capital Program 2022-23 update and 2022-23 sorry 27 program. And is it Jonathan? Yeah, that's right, Chair. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, Jonathan. On you go. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just give a very brief uh, overview of the paper. Uh, members have had the opportunity to um, have a look through it. So section five of the of the report gives uh, an update on the, the current year. Uh, current year programme, so that's 22 to 23. And then section six of the report really outlines the recommended or proposed uh, priorities for the 23 to 27 um, investment within our within our housing stock. Um, Appendix one obviously in details and a bit and a bit a bit more specifically just exactly what we would recommend um, the the priorities to be. Um, and I would really just point to um, the main the main priority, which which um, you can see from that is investment in energy efficiency works in our stock. Um, that being um, a range of measures such as windows and doors, heating replacements, um, insulation works as well um, across that across that four year period. Um, we'll continue to update members, of course, at, at Ward Business on, on progress against the, the current uh, programme and obviously also on the, the future programme as well. So um, I've just um, gone through that quite quickly, Chair, but uh, happy to pick up any specific questions that members may have. Thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate that. Uh, has any members got anything you want to raise? I'm not seeing any hands so far. No, no. Thank, thanks. Oh, sorry, Raymond. Raymond. Uh, thanks. Uh, just to acknowledge um, uh, the discussion and the um, and the meeting that we've already had with Margaret and with Jonathan and uh, and some of the points for clarification that we've already received in terms of uh, the housing capital programme. And uh, it's never going to be uh, enough. Um, we've already agreed in terms of um, the rent um, and what the impact might be for this uh, for this one year. But here's to looking forward to seeing what we can do to mitigate that over the uh, future years, Jonathan. Um, but also in terms of the capital um, maintenance uh, for our own stock here in Caithness um, and the, uh, I just wonder, um, can we have a, a discussion maybe at the uh, monthly housing meeting um, that we have now in terms of how flexible we can be with that, um, with the 15% that uh, we have for the environmental budget and where we would like that spent because we want that to be reflective of what the tenants um, wanted. And, you know, given where we are with the uh, current um, cost of living, that may have changed, Jonathan, um, since pre-COVID when we undertook that exercise. So that might be something worth looking at um, in, the, in the future going forward. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Raymond. That's a uh, good point there, right enough. Um, John? Raymond, you actually brought up what I was going to say. I was just going to ask about the, imp the impact on the maintenance, you know, given the capital a budget, um, but we can speak to uh, that, speak to that at the monthly meetings, yeah, in more detail. But it's good to see, you know, that you are leading on the the heating systems, which which will help a lot of our um, tenants as well. But we can speak about that more in the monthly meeting. 
Thank, thanks, Jonathan, and thanks, Jay. OK, John, th thanks very much for that. Yeah, it just shows the importance of the monthly meetings. Yep, thanks. Um, anybody else got any contribution? No, I think as a committee we have to uh, note item one and, and we're less there. Um, and also note the resources available for caseness at uh, item two. Uh, happy to note that. Yeah. yeah. And then we have to agree the proposed investment priorities in the HRA capital programme as set out in Appendix A, sorry, Appendix 1 to the report, which we've all read. Are we happy to agree that? Yep. Nobody saying otherwise. Thanks. We'll agree with that and note the update on the housing revenue account capital programme will continue to be provided through ward briefings and our future local committees. OK, Jonathan, thank you very much for that. I know it's been a long wait for you. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. And I'll see you at a future monthly meeting. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you very much for that. Right, now we shall move on to item 11, Wet Common Good Fund. And that was one of the, the later um, supplementary reports which you all received. And um, who, who is it that's going through that? Oh, it's yourself, Max. Sorry, I'm getting a wee bit confused here. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> yes. that's okay. Okay, okay so, Max. It's just... Okay, so members, same. Um, you all have the report. Sorry, it was uh, it was late. At, it was Friday before uh, you got it, but I won't go through the the report or the the financial report uh, line by line. But what I'll do is I'll maybe just point a couple of or, or note a couple of points of interest here. Um. So the uh, 3.3. .3, Royal Borough Wick community councillors and the wider community were consulted in the creation of the Common Good Fund and subsequent asset re uh, register throughout 2021-22. Uh, um, that will continue uh, with our strategic meetings as we as we go on through this year. Um, I think it's important to note that not all the running costs and liabilities associated with the it's a relatively new common good fund, so they weren't all identified and fully assessed, which may affect uh, future reporting and budgets. The annual report 21-22, if I'm, if I'm going too quick, just say, I'm just uh, rattling through, I appreciate that. Um, annual report 21-22, uh, as a common good fund was only established in 21-22, no budget was agreed for that year and no charges related to the cr creation of that uh, uh, fund were levied. Uh, therefore, the annual report simply sets out the income uh, and value of the assets of the fund at that time. Uh, that's, so that was the annual report for 21-22. The third quarter monitoring report. Uh, so when it, when the rent section, the members will note the estimated outturn is shown at 8,034. It was made up of 7,700 from the VJB and uh, 334 from the BBC. Um, just note, the members should know this, but the, the BBC lease ended in uh, August 22. Uh, the south turn is lower than the actual income uh, of, it's actually noted at 9384, but that will be sorted out, sorted out at the end of the year accruals because of when that rent is levied or collected, sorry. Uh, in the miscellaneous income section, uh, it consists of income from the invitation to pay parking scheme. Um, you'll note that the invitation to parking scheme raised 11,179, uh, with an estimated of 12,000 for the end of the year. The scheme was more successful, I think, than, than at first anticipated. Um, that was based on the fact that we didn't have really all of the car park until the end of July, so we missed quite a big chunk there uh, of potential revenue. Uh, in the expenditure section, the staff costs. Uh, in line with the approach taken for the Highland Council Common Good Funds, the WIC Common Good Fund will be charged for a portion of the Common Good Officer's time, see it as in the background there, relating to work done on behalf of the WIC Common Good Fund uh, from financial year 2022-23 onwards. Staff costs in there are for as the Common Good Officers expected to amount to 1250 for that three quarters up to March 20, sorry, March 22. Sorry, March 2022. Um, if we go down to 
5.5. Members should note that the running costs associated with the WIC Common Good Fund uh, uh, properties as a landlord have yet to be accounted for and attributed to the fund. Therefore, the funds will need to be so the, sorry. There'll be funds need to be set aside for future bu budgets to cover that cost that will appear uh, as we uh, progress. If we look at the budget for 23-24, uh, it, it, it closely mirrors the the, the previous year. Uh, the, sorry, the out terms for 22-23. Um, 6.2.2, uh, approval for the disposal by lease of Bignold House was granted by Wick Sheriff Court on the 2nd of December. Instructions have been sent to the Council's conveyance and legal team to process the lease transaction. Um, so that's not been that's not actually done yet. Annual income from Bignold House is expected to be a thousand pound. However, however, because they've got that one year break, that's not expected to appear. Uh, invitation to pay car parking. It's been a budget set at twelve thousand uh, pound for the uh, twenty two twenty three. But as as discussed, we're hoping to increase that in every way we can. Uh, potential property costs 6.3.4. Uh, as noted in section 5.5, .5, while income related to Wick Town Hall has been attributed to the fund, the cost of running the town hall, as, as we spoke earlier on, as a, a landlord of, of yet to be uh, um, highlighted exactly what that is. Future strategy. We've uh, at the time of writing this, it was, it was I was saying we're uh, we're going to be having uh, regular meetings with members and. Uh, WIC uh, Community Council can feed in two members as well and part of that and we would uh, we would hope to increase the income at WIC Town Hall but since since this was written in actual fact uh, we have actually had the first meeting as a, a just setting the marker down on how we're going to be going forward and there, that in 7.3 development of the strategy will take place during the first half of 23-24 including discussions with members and engagement with the Royal Borough of WIC Community Council so I appreciate that that was a real whistle stop uh, tour of that paper. Just time on my mind. I'm happy to take any questions from members. If there's anything I can't answer, I've got Sarah in the background. Raymond. Yeah, the it's good to see this uh, a report. That's the first report that we are actually seeing where there's an income and uh, and um, a liability. Well, at the moment we're not seeing much of the liabilities, but we are seeing the income stream. I still think that we can uh, sweat the asset, but as you were mentioning there, uh, sweat the assets. Uh, but as you were men mentioning there just now, um, that can be looked at in terms of when the committee or when the members meet. And we have we have now done that, um, and that was a that was a good meeting. Um, but here's where we report it in the public domain. Um, so, uh, by what what I mean by sweating the assets are if there is a car park in the common good. Um, and it is an invitation to pay, then we should be doing everything we possibly can to ask the tourists um, and locals as well. I mean, I, I support it. Um, who wish to support that uh, car park and their common good by default. Um, and, and let's reiterate, the money goes to the common good straight away. It is then uh, the liability or the charge is then applied to the common good uh, where we have to pay for a service uh, from the common good fund. So there's nothing goes to council first before it then comes to the common good. It's the other way about. And I think that that's absolutely right. We need to make sure that we emphasize that out in the public domain. But we should be doing what we, whatever we possibly can to be able to uh, sweat the assets. And that includes the town hall. I've, I'll, I'll say it on record here in the public domain. We now need to uh, get some sort of program together so that it's not just high, high life, highland, um, you know, staffing and, and um, you know, staffing the, the, the town hall. It's a cracking asset. The, the local community council are very keen uh, to understand just exactly what we can do with that town hall. Um, and I'm keen that we put a, a programme together that uh, sweats that asset as well. And it can be in all sorts of forms. And that's and we should have that listed for every asset that we have in the Common Good Fund. Uh, and I look forward to those discussions and I look forward to there being uh, more money coming into the, uh, the Common Good at a higher rate because we've done our due diligence and our commercially astute work to be able to do this. Uh, I'm just glad that we've got a common good fund again because of the fact that we were told for long enough that we didn't have one. Great. You're on mute, Ron. You're on mute, Ron. 
You're on mute, Ron. Uh, Jan. I'll sorry, go. sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> go on. So I've been getting on a wee bit right now. I was just about to say that, that us on this side of the county are watching here with bated breath because we're a wee bit behind you, but we'll be coming with a common good fund as well. Yes, thanks. Okay, Jan. Okay, thanks. I just want to thank all the councillors and everybody who was involved in getting this off the ground in the first place. I mean, it's went from nothing, nothing, to where we are now. And now we're, we're actually going to see, and we will have to, as you say, promote the car parks, promote the, the town hall, because um, it could be used for weddings, coffee mornings, whatever. We have this asset there and we need to use it. So, yeah, I'll be promoting it for various charitable things as well, So because it'll be ideal. Thanks, Jan. Wally? Thanks. Yeah, similar comments to myself. And as Jan said, consideration should be given to the former work that was done by Councillor Bremner and former Councillor Nicholas Sinclair, who did a power of work in getting this underway. They did a fantastic job. And it's great. Yes, the Town Hall, I think it's got great potential. It's an absolutely fantastic building, totally underused at the moment. And uh, yes, I look forward to uh, great discussions uh, around that uh, building. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. It's that. No, no, no more hands I'm seeing there yet. So as a committee, um, we're invited to note the annual report for the accounts, note the position of the Wet Common Good Fund as shown on the monitoring statement and agree the Wet Common Good Fund annual budget for 23-24. Are we happy with that? Yep. OK, we agree with that. Thank you very much, Mac, for, for that. And now we shall move on to item, I put it in as item 12. This is the urgent item which I've accepted, as I mentioned earlier. And I think we're over to Margaret. Sorry, Margaret, you've had a long wait <laughs> there, but I'm sure it's worth hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Afternoon, everybody. Yeah. Um, you have before you the um, a report which gives you all the information you'll need on garage rents for Caithness. And this afternoon you are invited to agree a level of rent increase to apply to those garages and garage sites. Sorry, Mar Margaret, can I stop you? Uh, sorry, Chair, you have to give a reason why it's an urgent item. And it's because prior to the budget uh, approval of 2023-24, I am... Um, so, sorry, Jane, I, I did see that at the beginning of the meeting, but I, I'll repeat it. You know, um, yeah. in, in terms of standing order eight and as chair of Caithness Committee, I have agreed to take an urgent item of business on garage rents 2023-24 in order to agree a level of rent increase to apply to Caithness garages and garage sites for the financial year 23-24. Thank, thank you, Chair. Sorry, Margaret, for interrupting you. That's fine. No problem. Thank you. Um, so developing local priorities for garages um, held in the revenue account um, was aggregated to the local areas um, a few years ago, um, which is why we're here to debate this today. And that aggregation also gives you the ability to look and make decisions on retention and disposal of garages um, and garage site, as well as set rent levels and investment. Um, last year, it was agreed there would be a 1% increase applied to garages and garage sites in Caithness. Um, point five gives you all the figures that you'll need to, to know. Um, current income, roughly 273000 for Caithness. Um, quite a substantial void rent loss, £90,000 a year potentially. Um, of the 392 garages, there are 160 occupied and of the 468 sites, there are 325 occupied. Um, actual rents vary between um, council tenants and non-council tenants as non-council tenants, um, we apply VAT to that. So that's why you'll see a difference in the, in the costs, the weekly costs. The average rent um, Highland wide is £10.46 a week and the garage site rent on average is £165 per week. So moving on to item six, rent options. Councillor Bremner. Sorry, my hands up ready for uh, coming in just when you're finished with your report. Thanks. All right. Okay. okay, thanks. 
um, consultation in the general rent increase for council house rents was based on options, and you well know this, of 3, 5 and 7%. Um, we're recommending today that a 7% rent increase is recommended for garage and garage site rents um, below the current inflation rate of 10.7. And be assured that the additional revenue received through this increase will be ring fenced to fund garage repairs and impro improvements and will partly offset increases in the cost of repairs. Um, then at 6.3, you've um, some clear figures there showing you the impact that a 3%, 5% and 7% increase will have. Um, the recommended 7% would mean that, that um, council tenants who could rent a garage would pay 75 pence more a week, for example, and a garage site rented by a council tenant would pay 11 pence more a week. And very importantly, any net additional rent income from garages and sites generated by any increase would also be applied as an increase in the area repairs budget for garages and garage sites in the forthcoming year. I'm happy to take any questions. OK, thank you, Margaret. Uh, Raymond? Um, mine isn't a question. Um, Margaret probably knows very much my um, views in terms of um, developing the garage estate. It's something that's been very close to my heart in Caithness um, since since we got elected. Um, in fact, we have been looking at certain garage estate uh, areas in, um, in WIC, um, both on a trial basis and actually uh, looking to put them in place um, whether it's a, we, and we've we've gone around and viewed many areas you can't get away from the fact that the uh, the garage estate is in poor condition in many areas we have uh, far too many voids it's how we manage to do something with them um, that is one of the reasons that we need the investment um, talking about the investment and our consideration in terms of uh, rent increases um i i have a different view in terms of uh, rent increases for garages than i do for rent increases for houses garages don't house people we don't have to pay for heating for them and therefore they don't impact on uh, generally they will not impact on if we if we raise the price of a a, a rental uh, for a garage um then we are not looking we are not impacting on the heating of that garage Whereas if, uh, the, uh, if it's a tenant in a house, we are. So for me, um, there is a, a totally different um, kettle of fish here. I think that the garage, um, the folks that have garages, by and large, I may be wrong, Margaret, but I believe that a fair number of them, if not quite a considerable number of them, are not used to house, um, are not used to house, they are not used to, uh, for vehicles, they are actually used for storage. Um, and the ability, and, and that falls down to choices being made by garage owners, um, either whether they are a tenant or a non-tenant of the council. And therefore, they should expect us to be investing in, those, uh, in, in that estate. That costs money, and right now it's costing us even more money to be able to, to look at that. I would endorse the 7%. I think that it's reasonable. I think that it is affordable, and if it is not affordable, then the choice has to lie with the with the tenant of a of a garage, and not necessarily in this case with the, uh, with uh, with the council. We've got to protect the interest of uh, those um, who have garages, and they're not going to be able to uh, see that without us investing in them. On this one, I'll be going for um, proposing a seven percent rise. You've got the figures quite clearly there. I do not think that they're unreasonable nor unaffordable for those who have garages, and if they and if they do become that way for an extra pound or less, seventy five pence, then I would suggest that the choices then lie with the tenants and not necessarily with the council. And that and and so I'll be proposing a seven percent uh, uh, rent rise uh, for garages. Um, and uh, garage sites and I'm glad to see that maybe that could give us an extra amount more to be able to reinvest in the garage estate or a certain proportion of that to be able to reinvest in the garage estate um, and I'm happy to hear if the principal housing officer has any comment on my views. Um, Thank you. I, really. I think it's a very opportune moment to really consider some serious investment in the garages. Um, before um, before the area housing manager moved on to be um, a service lead for um, 
housing investment and building maintenance, he set up a, a, a small development team. And that development team is now fully staffed up and their, their, their first major role is to look at the garages and garage sites in Caithness. They will, will be requesting title deeds. There's a whole lot of discrepancies about title deeds. There's going to be a lot of work put into this. If garages are beyond economic repair and there is no demand for them, we will consider taking them down. Um, so now now's the time to really consider investing in your garages when we have the, the support of this development team to really complete complete the circle, actually. OK, thank you, Margaret. Um, Jan? Uh, thank you, Margaret, for your report and thank you. And I've listened and noted everything you've said as well, Raymond. Um, some of our garages are in a terrible state and I totally agree with you. Some of them really need to be actually condemned. Um, this is going to be a silly question. Um, can we fix different rates for different things? You know, like, um, a, a different rate on the garages occupied um, to the garage sites, or does it have to be the same rate across the, the two areas? No, it doesn't. Um, it's certainly competent in terms of decision making to decide different rates for non tenants. Thank you. But can we do it for the, um, can we put like, a different percentage on garages occupied and then from garage sites. Yes, you can. Oh, thank that, you. That, that's within your gift following oh. the aggregation of those decisions to areas. Oh, thank you, Margaret. Thank you. OK, Jan. Um, Willie, you got your hand up? Yeah, thank you. Good to see you again, Margaret. Yes, garages. Yes, I've been involved <laughs> with your report for several uh, several meetings now. Several percent. This is pennies, absolute pennies we're talking about here. So uh, just a quick question, Margaret. You probably answered it before. This increase, is it coming anywhere near to purchase the materials? Bear in mind the huge cost, cost of such to repair such a garage these days. It must be difficult. Yeah, and I'll not be able to answer that. I wouldn't be the best person to ask that question of Willie. But I think the very important thing is the backup of the housing development team. They're going to look at garages. If garages are beyond economic repair, we won't be throwing money at them. If there is no demand for them, we'll have to look at other solutions. There's plenty of areas which are desperate for more car parking. There's lots of things we can do. And um, I'm really enthusiastic about the possibility of you agreeing to a 7% increase because we have this development team in who will be able to look at and consult with you, consult with our tenants and decide the best way forward. Okay, thank you, Margaret. Jan, do you want to come back? Or yeah, it's just the garage sites. I'm thinking about, I mean, a 7% increase in garage sites is a pittance. You know, it's hardly worth the paper, you know, can we can we increase that? You, you can, Jan, but uh, Councillor McCune, you can. But what you should bear in mind is that there is no site, there's no structure owned by the Highland Council on that site. Hence, there is less liability. There is no asset to improve. The site is simply a site, and the lease allows people to put their own structure with certain constraints to put their own structure on that site. The garages are a totally different ballgame. They're an asset. They're an asset that can deteriorate. They're an asset that can be regenerated. So it's different from a site. Thank you for that thanks. explanation, Margaret. Thanks, thanks, Margaret. Um, Raymond, do you want to come back there? Yeah, it's all a learning process, Jan, isn't it? Because yeah. um, some of us have been here before um, and, and, mm -hmm. and you would be surprised where some of the uh, garage sites are um, and the condition that those sites are in, and they, and without uh, and without a garage on them, um, so it, there's not really anything that would be. I don't see how we would uh, materialistically benefit from that. Um, to be quite honest, um, I think if, if 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 it was me, I'd be looking to put a a, a bigger increase on the actual um, tenanted sites uh, where we got uh, where we actually have um, structures that we need to maintain. Um, at this moment in time, I think I'm comfortable with the 7% at this moment in time. I'd like to see where the lie of the land goes within the next year. Um, and I'd like to hear, and, and maybe we'd like, I'd like to hear a little bit more from the, the tenants in terms of, well, look, here's what the opportunities, Mar Margaret, I've mentioned this to you as well about um, how we consult with the tenants for next year, both in terms of the rents for houses and in the rents for garages. And uh, and the options that that we we should be giving them rather than such diverse op op options of three, five, and seven, 
we should be more um we should be quite um bold um and letting them know that this is what you will get for an investment uh in your in, in the property um if you're up for paying uh, for that um so but for this year maybe seven percent i'd be happy with the seven percent and then let's look at uh, how we take that forward next year and that also gives us a, uh, an ability to be able to look at what the economic factors are out there as well thanks yeah yeah thank raymond i think it's good if you can actually see the figures and what you get from it yeah, very beneficial. Uh, Jan, are you coming back? Yeah, yeah, I'm comfortable with the seven percent as well. And I think if we give it the year and the the, the tenant the, the tenants that use the garages, whether it be for storage or the cars, if they see some improvements, they'll they'll see where their money's been going. So that'll be interesting to see in a year's time. But I'm quite comfortable with with the seven percent. It's it's not a lot, you know. Okay. Anybody else got anything? No more hands up there. Well, Ma Ma Margaret has uh, recommended the seven percent. Um, Raymond has proposed it. I'll second it. Yes, uh, that, that's fine. So, are we in agreement with that? You'll have excused the dog barking in the background, <laughs> but it was quite good the whole meeting. <laughs> okay. Yep, we accept that and uh, we'll go for the seven percent, mainly because of the investment side of things, thank Margaret. That's lovely. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. OK, thanks, Margaret. Right, folks, it's, the house is just going mad. There's phones ringing and the dog's barking. <laughs> it's been a long time. That music that you've got there just now, while I get your spoons out. <laughs> Can't do. You do as a yeah. entertainment to finish off, I think, right enough. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. The dog agreed with everything today. The bark on any <laughs> recommendation. He was voting well. <laughs> OK, folks, I think that's us now. I think we've uh, got our layout items through eventually. So I'd really like to, to thank everybody for their contributions, both from the members and the officers, and uh, we shall go and uh, have a cup of tea, I think. <laughs>